Hello and welcome to episode 91 of Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. I'm your co-host Russ over here and... And this is uh, your co-host Mike over here who handles the classical end of things, mostly anyway. <laughs> well, last week we had a uh, German theme, well, mostly made in Germany. Yeah, we, we got something German in almost every one of them except one album that I came up with, so... Yeah, and it's doing yeah. pretty well for downloads. And I wrote to all of the German jazz musicians that we featured, and we got nice uh, replies from the very saxophonist Marcus Bartlett. Yeah. Uh, let us know if you listened to that uh, album last week. The uh, last track that had cello and bass clarinet, that was his son on cello, <laughs> only 11 years old when it was recorded. I thought he did a fine job. At, wow. Uh, and I also heard from Guido May, who's a big name in jazz, especially in Germany. And uh, he liked my Guido joke, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, that is that is an American perspective. Yeah, I mean, certainly one I had too. Yeah, he said our uh, little discussion made his day of his recordings. Nice. So that was good funky stuff. It was good and funky stuff. I agree. Today we're uh, going down low on the low strings. Yeah, for this episode. I'm going to get into a little bit of low string theory here. That's right. Yeah. All cello and bass stuff. And we've already decided that we're going to spring the Christmas episode uh, next week. So you can look forward to that in the next right. episode too. Yeah. So we noticed that the, uh, <laughs> that suddenly last year's Christmas episode is getting a lot of downloads, which actually is kind of normal because a lot of those um, albums yeah, they they last. Christmas albums get played every year, so right. people are looking for stuff to listen to for Christmas, and they they got that one. So we're gonna put this one out early. Now, here's the thing: I'm not getting all the albums that I want on this. There are, there are like five of them anyway, but um, I had to choose three, and I probably would have chosen another one, but I just haven't don't have like the the notes or the uh, text for them yet. But I'll mention it on the podcast so you can check it out. Okay. We just won't talk about it at length. Okay. Now, there are five albums, like classic albums this year, that kind of caught my eye. Right. And so far they came out. And sometimes they come out in December too. It's, it's, it's too late for a Christmas album to come out. She's, theoretically, you're listening to it, you know, already, you know. Right. But le that happened to me last year. That was one that came out in like December. So, yeah, this sounds like it would have been pretty good. Yeah. yeah, most of the ones I got came out in uh, October, November. So. That's usually what happens. That's the release time for Christmas albums. And then they record them in July. Could you imagine? <laughs> in their short the spirit, you know. <laughs> Maybe they go south to the equator. Recorded in Australia or something. I don't know. And then on the Christmas weekend, we're going to uh, get together in the mountain lair for a little yeah. Christmas feast and record right. our best of 2022 episode. Yeah, that'll be uh, really interesting. I've already started looking through. I can't I can't make the list yet because I don't know what you got coming up right. for the, the last few weeks yet. But I've pretty much sort of decided on a lot of stuff. There are okay. one or two things that have to be on there. So Yeah. yeah but there's a lot the of stuff. Way. I'm going to have to leave a lot out. So I'm hoping you're going to pick up the slack okay. over there. Yeah, I've got you to know. start reviewing. Uh, I can do that because Christmas music listening is a little bit lighter of a task than some of the <laughs> other stuff we listen to. So what well, depends extra really? Time. It depends on what it's like. I've, I've got some interesting choices, but if it's all very traditional, it can get annoying really fast. Yeah, get me in the humbug mood too early. Yeah, the humbug uh -oh. mood. Yeah. By the way, if anyone's listening, you're looking for a good Christmas album to listen to, a jazz Christmas album. One of our favorites. Um, you know, we, I definitely speak for both of us on this one. I just know it is the Joey DeFrancesco album, uh, right. Home for the Holidays. Now, Joey DeFrancesco, of course, died this year. So I'm, just, I'm really kind of making a big push for people like over the holiday season to give that mm -hmm. a listen because it's really special. I like it a lot. And he, he was just one of the greats of, yeah. the, uh, of his generation. Yeah. The great of his generation, really. We'll uh, bring up our old-time favorites uh, to next week. Yeah, I do that all the time. Most of my old time favorites are, are jazz, really, because I like jazz Christmases. Right. I've got a few Christmas, uh, a few classical favorites, too, that are a little uh, unusual. Medieval Christmas is actually a nice thing. People should consider that. Hmm. Yeah, it's good stuff. Let's think about that one. Hmm. All right. <laughs> anyway, before we uh, get into the low string theory program this week, I want to remind everyone that in the episode description, you'll find links to Spotify and Apple Music for the music we'll discuss, other than one Hyperion release, which is not available on streaming. Uh, so you can uh, oh, that's right. yeah. check out the homepage and decide if it's worth your purchase or not. I think Let me like decide it. for you. It is worth your purchase. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> also, at the top of the description, there's a link to the full episode playlist. That's all the music in one place on Deezer. That's our favorite CD quality streaming platform. You can also follow us there on the podcast 
Look us up, Adult Music Podcast. Get the podcast and the playlists all in one place. Uh, also, if you can't see the full description or list on whatever app or platform you listen to us on, you can always come over to our host site, Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com, and all the links are easy to follow there. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. And if you take just a moment to give us a ranking or write a review, that helps us get listed in the category recommendations, and then we can grow our audience, and that will make us really happy. You can also come over and follow us on our Facebook page. You get some extra info, new releases throughout the week. I put up a bunch of them this week, and you can leave a message or comment there as well. And otherwise, if you'd like to contact us directly uh, with any comments or questions, you can get in touch by email. Our address is adultmusicpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. And before we get into the program, we'd like to recommend a few other podcasts to check out during the week. First one is Something Came From Baltimore. It's a jazz, blues, and R&B interview podcast uh, featuring interviews with a lot of musicians that we've discussed recordings from. Todd Marcus, Joey Dan Francesco. That's run by Tom Gauker. He's always got something interesting going on every week. We've also got Famous Interviews and Neon Jazz that has interviews with artists, musicians, and writers. That's done by Joe Domino. And there's a kind of dialogue uh, about uh, differences in people and building community called The Same Difference. And I'll put links to all of those at the end of the episode description. Check those out if you need some more podcasts to get you through the week. And is there anything else? Let me see. I think we're okay. We're just going to get leap right into the uh, cello recordings here, I guess. So the uh, first album we have today for the cello, it's all cello in um, mm. classical today. And the first one is the Hyperion release that we mentioned earlier, A Golden Cello Decade, 1878 to 1888. And the artists mm. are one of my favorites, Stephen Isserlis, and I hope I got the. I I always have to check this guy, the name of this guy's pronunciation first, because I'm not sure where the accent falls, and I might have gotten it wrong there. But I didn't do it today, so anyway, I'm gonna say I'm gonna go for Stephen Isserlis, and if I got it wrong, somebody can write in and tell me, or I can check it later and then be embarrassed. Anyway, and Connie Shi on the piano. Now we've heard these two together um, before. This is on the Hyperion label, I should mention, and that means it's not on streaming. So you're gonna have to go to their website, check it out, and possibly buy it and i recommend you do because you'll hear why mm. these two have made two albums together before and both of them were on the beast label not on hyperion so you can actually download those we, last year we talked about music from proust's salons we kind of coupled this with the similarly named program by uh the, your your favorite violinist there um what's <laughs> the baroque violinist that we always talk about and who we may talk about name, uh yeah. Yeah, and we may talk about a, in a few weeks, actually, because he's got another mm. new album that I really like. And they did one called The Cello in Wartime, too, this um, this pair. Mm. Uh, the Team Langlois de Soir, that's who it Soir, was. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I liked, I prefer the Isser Listen Shi record to that one. Yet you and all the, well, I don't know about you, but all the um, the entire press liked the uh, Langlois de Soir one better, anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe I liked it a little better, yeah, just for the energy, but... I liked that program a lot. I just kind of had problems with some of the balances and stuff. Mm. Anyway, but that's okay. It's a, it's well worth hearing anyway. All right. So anyway, now one of the reasons you should um, buy, buy this CD is because, well, actually you don't have to buy it. You can read. The, um, Stephen Isselis wrote the booklet notes and uh, as readers of the books he's published will already know, he's an excellent writer. He's very witty and uh, down to earth, well-informed and confiding in style. In other words, he writes booklet notes the way I try to do this podcast, but I think he knows a lot more than I do. He does a lot more research. So uh, he gets uh, some interesting, uh, and also he's got like direct um, experience with a lot of the music he's talking about as he plays it. So um, he's got some interesting uh, insights into it. Always well, well worth reading. Uh, you can read those, um, those booklet notes, by the way, on the um, Hyperion website. They publish them all the time, which is great because uh, they're worth reading. Yeah, I'll be quoting from them at points because he's so insightful, I can't let them go. The 1880s, according to Isserlis, were a golden cello decade. We can think about this. The golden, think of the electric guitar, first of all. That was the 1960s, right? As um, many of our listeners might even remember. <laughs> okay. we, I, our generation knows mm -hmm. it as well, just we were born afterwards. but uh, Well, we were born in it, but um, came to it afterwards. 
you, you also think of the 1920s as the, the big swing decade in jazz. And um, I like to always teach in, like whenever I'm teaching classical music, that the 1830s were the big piano decade. That was the uh, decade when uh, Chopin, Liszt, and uh, Mendelssohn were um, just really just changing the rules of how the piano was going to be played in Paris. Hmm. All right. Well, apparently, according to Isserlis, uh, the eighteen eighty the eighteen eighties were a big um, decade for um, the cello. We're going to hear the works on this album and uh, other works that were written in that decade were um, Grieg's um, cello, I guess, sonata, mm-hmm. Strauss's uh, second version of his sonata, and the first one is recorded here. Brahms' second cello sonata, um, Frank's uh, sonata, and for piano or and violin or cello. I actually prefer the violin version of that, but. I'm not going to take that away from Chellis. And Faure's Elegy, Sasson's Le Signe, The Swan. So a lot of famous cello mm. works written in that decade. Cello concertos had to wait until the heyday of Rostropovich from 1959 to 1970. Uh, so again, the 60s. So uh, if you were listening to electric guitar, you were missing out on the, uh, the big <laughs> cello decade of the 1960s. And it was all Rostropovich. He, he commissioned a load of new works mm. uh, for the cello. Okay, so here on this album... Isserlis wants to explore some works that he describes as planet-like. Now, what he means by that is works that orbit the starry works mentioned above. Stars would be little suns, okay? Mm. So um, they're not the, of major importance in the history of the universe, but they're often well worth exploring in their own right. Now, this is uh, this is thinking right after my own heart because um, the, the music I program on this podcast is often a little, um, you know, it's it's often off the beaten track. We'll get some Beethoven and Mozart in there, but a lot of times I'll be have these composers that people aren't really too familiar with because I want people listening to their music too. This, this is what Sir Liss is exploring here, this type of music, because it's it's just, um, there's so much discovery to be made there because we in classical music, if you if you grew up with that in the 60s and 70s, there was still the uh, the idea of the repertoire that you had like this, this limited number of composers and they were played all the time mm-hmm. and everybody was going to record their Beethoven symphony. That still happens, but uh, there's a lot more that's um, played and recorded these days. Well, more recorded than played because um, you have to draw an audience and people are going to come to hear Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. This is this is one of the big problems of living in Japan. Whenever a visiting orchestra comes, they they play Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. <laughs> that's that's basically it. You always yeah. have to hear that. The yeah. programming is not so exciting because the people won't come. With it. I understand, but you know, there's a. I wish we were a, still a concert going people, really all over the world. Anyway, let's get into this. Um, program. Uh, the first piece is actually a pretty famous piece for the cello, Max Bruch's Kol Nidre, Adagio on Hebrew Melodies, Opus 47, from 1881. This is actually originally a cello and orchestra work, and uh, this is a um, an arrangement for v- uh, the cello and piano, and it also has Olivia Jaguars on the harp, and there's a reason for that that um, Isserlis explains. It's a well-known work, and um, Isserlis says it's here because of the two works at the end of the album, which he labeled as footnotes on the uh, on the CD box anyway. We'll talk about more of those later. Brook, by the way, Kol Nidre is Hebrew melodies. He was Christian, but appreciated Jewish music due to his friendship with the cantor-in-chief in Berlin at the time, Abraham Jacob Lichtenstein. And Kol Nidre is a melody traditionally sung on the eve of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the melody is powerful with its sobbing, falling intervals. Brook has the melody played three times with increasing intensity, which is done in the service as well. Um, the second half of the work has nothing to do with Kol Nidre. It's based on a part of the setting by the British Jewish composer Isaac Nathan, which we'll hear later, of one of Byron's famous Hebrew melodies. Um, Lord Byron, that is. And uh, this is one of the pieces heard in the footnotes at the end of the album. We'll hear it later. So anyway, this piece starts quietly in the piano with lovely chiming chords way up and a descent, as we will hear throughout the uh, piece. There's a lot of uh, descending sort of patterns. The cello comes in at the 43 second mark, way up front and full toned. This is why I always listen to Stephen Isserlis. I just can't let go of him. He, mm. It's gorgeous recorded sound. He has this big fat tone that takes up the entire lane. <laughs> you can't pass him yeah. on the highway. It's just he's taking up all the space. I think he okay. sounds the fattest I've ever heard him before because yeah. I have all these other Hyperion recordings, but I was really in awe of the warmth 
depth and breadth of the tone of his instrument on this recording. Yeah, he's um. The, I think the last one we heard too, the one with the uh, the Proust, also had mm. that big fat tone on it too. Uh, he's he's like a big um, eighteen wheeler truck on the highway that you just can't get around or <laughs> see around. Okay. Anyway, gorgeous recorded sound on the cello too. This is a really beautiful recording too. The uh, engineer uh, gets a shout out there, and I should probably look him up. I never write the engineer's name down on the, in my notes, but I really should. I'll give him a shout out a little later. Okay, this is a, the piano sounds rather quiet behind him, but it is audible. Now, in this case, I want to say the piano is really in the accompaniment role because the, this is really a, a cello and orchestra work, and all the color of the orchestra is taken away mm -hmm. here on the piano. This is an example of a melody that's ideal for the cello. Uh, the instrument's deep, throaty sound at its low end puts across the pleading, lamenting feeling of this work perfectly. Gorgeous tone and legato lines by Isserlis, too. I, want, I keep wanting to say it the old way. I'm sure it's Isserlis. Okay. The piano gets more involved and present after the three-minute mark, and she's tone is fine. When she plays, she's not... It, one of the reasons that Isserlis is so emotive in his playing is he, he has a kind of rhythmic flexibility with his line. It's very subtle. Like, he doesn't play, like, metronomically. He's, he's kind of slightly stretching out tones or kind of you know, kind of squeezing mm -hmm. certain notes just to bring out the, the maximum expression. Uh, his, his, um, the pianist, she, now she, I, I don't want to call her an accompanist because she's got an equal role in some of these pieces. She's um, not as flexible as him. And uh, just because he's so expressive, you can kind of hear that. Um, she's fairly straightforward in her playing. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. She sounds great, but I'm just saying this kind of, this service is really expressive on this record. I think he's one of the world's greatest living cellists, actually. Hmm. At 5 minutes and 22 seconds, we hear Olivia Jaguars enter on the harp for more atmosphere. And Isserlis writes in the notes that the harp part in the orchestral version is irreplaceable, so he's included it here. <laughs> just for that reason, he just liked it a lot. Wow. Yeah, we hear both harp and piano in this section, which is an unusual combination. You either get one or the other, usually. Mm -hmm. In this section, we hear the melody Brooke got from Isaac Nathan's setting of Byron's Hebrew melodies. The section comes across as conciliatory due to the warm legato of the cello's tone and the soothing presence of the harp. Yeah, on this, really on the whole album, but on this track especially, Isserlis is the star. I mean, he's really the uh, center of attention. He's kind of creating a gravitational field himself. Yeah, before I forget i really want to mention the um the engineer here it's uh boy i can't even read this arnie anselberg and recording producer jonathan allen so good work gentlemen i want to call you out <laughs> i can't say excellent yeah. recording of this album okay now the next track or the next three tracks are the three movements of richard strauss's cello sonata in f major opus six all right now this is a famous work, but this is not the famous version. This is uh, composed in 1881. It's the original version of the work. And this has got an interesting story. Strauss uh, disowned this version of his sonata, oh. um, which he revised into a second version. He replaced the last two movements completely. So they're, they're different than the two you hear here. And he revised uh, the first movement. And the second version saw great success. So we never heard this one again. Isserlis, um tells a story in the booklet notes where he, um, I think it was Daniel Muller's shot, who's um, another cellist, um, had visited uh, Strauss's um, grandson or something. <laughs> Isserlis told him to ask to see the original uh, version of the cello sonata. And uh, apparently um, Strauss's grandson didn't want to show, he did show it to him, but he didn't, he said, uh, you know, my grandfather didn't like this and neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> Which is going to mean, but I mean, we have it now. It eventually got published, I think, in the 1990s. But of course, the second one's the one I was recorded. So this is rather unique. You get to hear um, mm. the early version of it here. It's almost like a new, different piece. And it's good. All right. Um, <laughs> I mean, if, you get, if you're a composer, you look at really closely at it and you see some of the material. Oh, it's not as inventive as it could be or something like that. It's mm. a general audience today isn't even going to notice this sort of thing. Let's see. First movement, Allegro con brio. This has a big throaty entrance by the cello with fortissimo piano chords as well. I actually had to turn down the volume. I have to have the volume up for the first piece called Nidre. The explosive opening dies down for the second more amiable theme, accompanied by quick repeating chords on the piano. 
Yeah, actually, Is- Isserlis also has a lot of fleck of charisma in his playing, and Schick kind of really takes a background role um, in her piano playing. And so your ear remains glued, at least minded, to uh, Isserlis's playing. And again, I don't want to denigrate uh, Schiss playing. She's fine as a chamber partner, with Isserlis clearly in the lead here, and his interpretation is excellently realized. I, do, I guess I'm spoiled by the recordings he made with Stephen Hoff, who's really a great, a really mm. great pianist and really in his league, in Isserlis's league, as a as a great soloist. Okay, that said though, this movement comes alive in this performance. It's a bit different, as mentioned, from the way we normally hear this piece, and the next two movements are completely different. The Larghetto, second movement, a lovely melody that Isserlis, true to form, shapes warmly and beautifully. Um, I do like the cello's throaty ending phrase on the section from around a minute and 40 seconds to two minutes, after which he bursts in to underline a new section. By the way, this word throaty I keep using, it's something peculiar to Isserlis's attack. I don't say it on the either of the other two albums we're going to talk about here. Hmm. He really has like a big, rich tone. And Connie Schiff here keeps a quiet tone in this section and gets a nice music box quality from the piano as Isserlis quietly but with great presence plays the legato theme. Uh, the opening theme comes back at 4 minutes and 20 seconds with an impressive hush heard in both instruments. Uh, Schiff, the Connie Schiff, is particularly good in the quiet chiming section at 5 minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, lovely writing by Strauss here. Uh, we also hear his very vocal style of writing in the cello's lines, even in this early version of the work, right? We associate Strauss with those uh, soaring soprano arias <laughs> from his operas and from his uh, last songs and things like that. Well, the cello gets a bit of that in the Larghetto. though. We hear a, a bit of that. Anyway, the third movement, Allegro Vivace, the theme features a lot of hopping s- starts and stops to the rhythm. Uh, the interplay between cello and piano sounds tricky, but is put across well. There's an appealing melody with a repeat not taken by Isserlis with just enough attack for the listener to be aware that it's a repeating note and not a held one. Subtle playing here. Once this section ends, we get a development section featuring the repeated note theme in the cello after the third minute. At 4 minutes and 15 seconds, the piano gets a rhythm that sounds like the middle section of the Forlan movement of Ravel's Tombeau de Couperin. Uh, Schiff plays this appealingly, but I really don't like the hard tone she gets when she plays Fortissimo here. We get back to the opening material for a satisfying ending, a version of this piece that's well worth hearing. Okay, that's a per- I want to just say that's a personal thing with mine. I kind of found this with certain pianists when they get this really hard kind of tone. It's just mm. it's, it's not something that appeals to my ear personally. I like the I'm very much in the uh, the soft, pearly, Murray Pariah toned school of <laughs> listening to the piano. So personal preference there. Anyway. Tracks five through eight, this is really the centerpiece. Well, I don't know about that. It's certainly Isserlis' centerpiece. Antonin de Vorjac's four romantic pieces, opus 75. And this is arranged by Isserlis. Originally for violin and piano, but in fact, it was originally, originally for two violins and viola. <laughs> de Vorjac wrote it for a neighboring young chemistry student taking violin lessons from a professional violinist. Uh, de Vorjac would have played the viola part in that it was rearranged probably because there wasn't much of a market for that particular orchestration it's the middle piece of the program and Isserlis is directly in the spotlight here as the piano plays an accompanimental role yeah i mean mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just really providing chords here i i don't think you would get a, a pianist of stephen huff's stature to <laughs> to play this piece <laughs> he'd have to have an equal part anyway the first um one is called is labeled allegro moderato it's romantic. That's boy underlining that word. But this may as well be a song with its highly singable melody. Isfilis plays this with great sensitivity. His subtle crescendos and decrescendos during the theme have an ebb and flow to them, reminiscent of the natural world, like the pull of the moon on the tide. See, there's something very natural about his his phrasing, his his dynamics. He's really an amazing player. This is very much a cellist piece, even though it was originally for violin. Uh, with the piano in the role of accompanist, the cello plays the melody throughout. The second uh, one is, uh, the second of the romantic pieces is Allegro Maestoso. It opens with dramatic forte chords, um, followed by a quieter ending. Uh, this goes loud, soft in the phrases. Isserlis really digging into the string to produce a raspy tone on fortes. This is one of the qualities I like so much about the cello is those that really 
big, rich mm-hmm. tone, and he gets it right here. On the piano sections, not the piano instrument, but the soft, the piano um, dynamic, the cello remains sweet, particularly for the sweet ending phrase. Third um, one, Allegro Appassionato. This is a gentle song-like piece, like the first of these four romances. The piano plays accompanying bass notes and rippling arpeggios. I like the stormy double-stopping Isserlis employs in the middle section after the one-minute mark. There are two dramatic crescendos here that ebb away, the last one meeting the incoming wave that is the opening theme. Very nice. That's a, a nice um, transition. It's lovely, and Isserlis puts across uh, more than what's simply in the score. The fourth uh, romantic piece, the Larghetto. It's a quiet, lamenting melody with rocking back-and-forth accompaniment in the piano. Isserlis's way of making the last note of his short phrases seem to disappear on a breath is very appealing, invoking a singer's approach. Uh, he does this mostly in the first minute, but varies the approach subtly through this almost eight-minute piece. Thankfully, because it's a bit samey as a composition. He really makes this work, I think. Uh, we hear that same dotted two notes followed by a falling third throughout. A true professional at work here, folks. This is uh, He really makes this piece come alive. All right, tracks 9 through 11. Louise Adolfa Lebeau. Okay, cello sonata in D major, opus 17, from 1878. <laughs> in the booklet note, Isserlis remarks that it would have made for a better album title to stick to the 1880s as the great cello decade, which I sort of announced hmm. in the beginning of this uh, discussion. But he wanted to include this work in the program. It was composed in 1878, so he called it 1878 to 1888 <laughs> since no, uh, none right. of the uh, featured pieces are composed after 1888. Louise Adolphe Lebeau was German, not French as you might think from hmm. her name, and her full title was, boy, the names they gave people, Louise Caroline, what is this? I can't even read this. Louise Caroline Marie Henriette Adolphe Lebeau. They gave wow. people a lot of names back then. Good thing they didn't have credit cards back then. You would never get that. Yeah, it would never hand. fit. Yeah. Uh, she was the daughter of a military officer and his wife who pushed for Louise to have a full education. Unusual for women in those days. She started as a pianist, but didn't like the concert life, and then decided to pursue composition. You know, there there were quite a few women pianists at the time, Clara Schumann Mm. being the the most famous one. I get the impression that they didn't like the concert life very much, a lot lot of the other ones as well. I don't know. I think that's part of the reason you don't hear so many of them. So she decided to pursue composition. And her life was uh, full of frustrations and conflicts, many of them centered around her struggle to give women a fair chance as composers. Yes, in the 19th century, this was very much a men's field. There's no trace of frustration in this sonata, however. And it's really nice. This is, this is one of those great discoveries, a, a nice a work that uh, you'll enjoy hearing um, that you've sh- almost surely never heard before. Um, the first movement, Allegro Molto, starts with a melodic cello line way down in the throaty deep end. There it is again, with the piano accompanying in the low end as well. The piano sprinkles figuration as the cello continues the theme. Uh, they trade, and the piano has a chord theme played with a marmorial quality by Shi, which Isserlis gets next, and he softens its edges a lot. This is a really pretty work, very satisfying. In a minute and 35 seconds, we hear a variation on the opening material, then back to the original opening at a minute and 55 seconds. At two minutes and eight seconds, we're in the development, which remains highly melodic. It's brief, and we're already back to the theme at three minutes and 10 seconds. Actually, this is a pretty short piece, really. It's hmm. All three movements are fairly short. Connie Shea sounds a lot more in her element in this work. Uh, she sounds actually pretty inspired um, by it, so I, I like her playing here. Uh, she plays light arpeggiated figuration and gets that sprinkling rain effect in it. We briefly hear the opening theme again at the five-minute mark as we head to the end of this brief movement. The middle movement, Andante Tranquilo, is also brief at four minutes and 30 seconds. Isserlis gets a beautiful hushed tone as she plays quietly in the low end of the piano. The partnership is working especially well in this piece. The cello has a melting melody that Isserlis plays beautifully, stretching it out for extra sweetness of a good kind. This isn't like, not of the saccharine kind, in other words. The middle section has rippling figuration from the piano and a quicker melody in the cello. 
Third movement, Allegro Vivace, has a quick dotted rhythm in the melody. You know, that's dun, 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 a dotted rhythm. And proceeds like a march at times, although it's in 4-4. Four, four. Isserlis does a lot to make the movement expressive. For example, the pulling back on the tempo and volume in the one-minute mark. The dotted rhythm melody is highly appealing. And one welcomes it every time it returns in this rondo form movement. Shi shows some dexterity in her line after two minutes and with very light, quick scales in between her melodic notes. Listen to her just from three minutes well into the fourth minute where she and Isserlis trade off lines. A prolonged dramatic approach to the final cadence brings the work to a close. All right, and then we get to the uh, two footnote pieces that uh, relate to um, Max Brooks' Kol Nidre, that which opened the program. This first one is called um, is by Ernst David or David Wagner or Wagner. This is uh, called Kol Nidre. It's number one of his Shir Zijon, S-C-H-I-R, Z-I-J-O-N, Opus 44. It's programmed to act as a comparison to the Brook work. Uh, there were several settings of Kol Nidre, Nidre written in the 19th century. Wagner was Polish-German, this Wagner, um, a church organist who evidently did not share his famous namesake's anti-Semitism. <laughs> I couldn't imagine Ricard writing a Kol Nidre anyway. Isserlis claims he programmed this not only for its musical qualities, but because he knew Richard Wagner would, would have been apoplectic to see the track listing Wagner Kol Nidre <laughs> on the album. Anyway, but it's not that Wagner, it's Ernst David Wagner. Anyway, she. The uh, pianist starts this out. She's playing chords, and they're very rock-like and severe. The tempo is very slow for this, or it sounds slow when compared to the Brooks setting. The theme is played low in the cello, and it sounds downright despairing and heavy, more so than in the Brook, who I imagine was going for a different effect. Uh, the interpretation is moving. And the 13th track and final one, the second footnote, is Isaac Nathan's Oh, Weep for Those, which is one of Byron's Lord Byron's Hebrew melodies, um, which he wrote from 1815 to 1819. This is arranged by Stephen Isserlis. Now, Isaac Nathan claimed that his musical settings of Byron's poetry were based on ancient Hebraic music. Max Brook apparently believed him and used this song, um, not only in Kol Nidre, but also as the last of his three Hebraic Gezenga <laughs> choral hmm. works, written around the same time as Kol Nidre, without making any mention of Nathan's name in the score. <laughs> oh. Nathan was a pugnacious fellow who was a passionate boxing fan and would not, one would guess, have been happy about that. <laughs> it yeah. might have shown his displeasure, <laughs> Surlis writes. This is why he's such a great writer, uh, as well as a great cellist, Stephen Surlis. In rather alarming ways, but in fact, he would have had only himself to blame since he credited the melodies to the ancient Hebrews and not to himself. Anyway, the final twist is that this melody appears not to have been Jewish at all in the end, but taken <laughs> by Nathan from a Northumbrian folk song. So that's in in Great Britain. Isserlis implies that due to his being a difficult character, Nathan was obliged to emigrate to Australia in 1841. <laughs> I like that. Due, due to his being a difficult character, just the, the images that it gives, you had to em emigrate. Okay. So he emigrated to Australia in 1841, where he composed the first Australian opera, became known as the father of Australian music. Boy, talk about a wow. big life change. And became the first person in the Southern Hemisphere, as far as we know, to have been run over by a horse-drawn tram, which ended his <laughs> life. Oh, what a story. Anyway, this is his piece. He's a colorful character, and uh, you can sample him here. This piece starts with a quiet piano line, a chord-based melody, it's a melody is played over changing chords, and Isserlis comes in for the melody, which consists of short, weeping phrases. All of it is tenderly played, particularly by the piano. Uh, the piece itself is a straightforward song setting. We end the entire program with three emphatic cadential chords on the piano. All right, so in the end, this is an expectedly, beautifully played, and cleverly programmed album, and it was really the programming that, well, it was Isserlis' is playing that really drew me to it. But it's cleverly programmed as well. You can easily listen to this all the way through. It's a great, it flows really well. And it's all interesting music. Isserlis is among the finest cellists out there. He may very well be the finest. It's always a pleasure to hear him. And uh, she, her, Connie Shit accompanies admirably. I liked her more in the, from the, um, let's see, the uh, Louisa Adolfo Lebeau piece onwards. 
I, I feel like, yeah, Isur, Isurlis really is the, uh, the more dynamic of these artists. He's got a lot of charisma and you can hear it very clearly. Um, he really steals the spotlight in this partnership with his beauty of tone. And he has the flexibility, the phrasing flexibility of the, of a singer. He can kind of like stretch the melody like it's taffy when shaping phrases. The two are better matched than the Lebeau piece, which is a lovely, highly melodic find with appealing melodies. So I'd say if you're a cello fan, you really need to hear this. And I think that's basically true of any album Easterlist puts out. Yeah, it's a great cello showcase. The material is really dripping romantic stuff. Mm. But that's what I love best for cello. You know, I, I really like yeah. that. And he has you think that, there would have been more cello music from this era, really. Yeah. He has that mm. tone and great phrasing to carry it off and make it wonderful. And as you said, the program's interesting and unique. There's stuff we haven't heard before. A unique version in there. The piano, I felt, is a little bit subdued uh, or a little hard in spots compared to the cello, but I think she does a good job. I really feel mm. like she's adjusting, making sure that the cello is always, you know, the main center of the program, which it is. And it certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> so she mission accomplished if that's what was going yeah, on. I've enjoyed all of his other recordings, and I'm a big fan of this general era of romantic cello works and this one is going to be right there with the rest of them i want to listen to it again and again yeah i know um i we, i know a, a few cellists around here that here where we live out here mm. in japan and they um they often one of the things they like to do is they lament like that their favorite composer didn't write a concerto for cello and Beethoven did, you know, he has a violin concerto and five piano concertos, but no cello concerto. Oh. He did write five great cello sonatas, though, yeah, for well, cello and but piano. there's plenty of stuff for the cello. <laughs> well, yeah, there is, and there is now, especially. Part of the reason that we heard so much, like, piano and violin music in the, in the uh, Romantic era in the 19th century is, first of all, because of Franz Liszt. Mm-hmm. And uh, also Chopin, but Franz Liszt really just changed the technique and everybody started doing that. And also pianists are generally composers, especially in that era. Right. So they wrote a lot of their own music. Um, the piano pretty much invites composition with its whole layout of keys. You know, you can kind of almost see what you're writing. And uh, the other one, instrument, was, big instrument was the violin, of course, because of Paganini. He stretched the uh, technique. So there were loads of violin pieces from the 19th century, too. The cello had to wait for Rostropovich, really, in the uh, 20th century to commission all those cello mm-hmm. concertos now it became a big soloist but because of him so that's probably why you needed that great soloist to captivate right. everyone and the romantics were they were a, they were a particular type so this Israelist program is a little unusual because when we hear mixed programs of uh, cello music usually it's 20th century music and that's going right. to be the case with the next album coming up which is called uh, song it's by Sheku Kane Mason of the um, very talented Kane Mason family. They, they, all of them play, I'm sure, but I think uh, three or four of them are becoming classical music stars. And Sheku is probably the biggest star of them all at the moment. He's a cellist, and he's accompanied by lots of other people, which I will um, mention as we go. As the booklet note indicates, uh, Sheku Kane Mason does indeed craft unique programs of music. And this is another one. <laughs> yeah, this is unique, to say the least. This album specifically celebrates the singing quality of the cello, hence the title song. The booklet notes are fairly informative, letting us know what we need to know while acting like a quasi-interview with um, Sheku Kane Mason himself. Now, his sister also appears on this album, Isata Kane Mason. So I'm going to refer to Sheku Kane Mason as Sheku. I mean, like I, like I know him personally. I don't, but uh, please excuse me for that. It'll just be easier <laughs> to, and, and less confusing if I call him by his first name. Anyway, the first track is, um, we start traditionally here, Star of the County Down, a famous um, Irish melody. This is arranged by uh, Sheku Kane Mason himself. It's a beautiful tone. Not as big and fat as this Sir Liss's, though, okay? But it is a really beautiful tone that he gets. Um, this haunting tune works well on the cello and exposes its vocal quality well. You know, we're right away, we've got this um, concept of song um, being realized. Mm-hmm. Now, this is recorded pretty close. You can hear reversals of the bowing direction, but that's part of hearing the cello, I guess, so no worries. Anyway, second track, uh, Joseph Parry. This is um, a Welsh song called... Uh, Mavanwi, arranged by Sheku Kane Mason. Mavanwi, no accent in in that word. 
I said Mala, I said it the American way. Mavan Wee. This is also a haunting tune, as are most um, folk tunes from the British Islands. And I'm sensing that uh, Sheku Kana Mason likes this one better than Star of the County Down. There's more warmth in the melody here, a deeper tone, with the emotions drawn out in the vibrato used in the long notes. I think he's overdubbed himself here, but here too, because at the 1 minute and 20 second mm -hmm. mark, a cello playing a pizzicato bass line emerges, and no one else is credited on the album, so I'm guessing it's all him. For the third verse, he's overdubbed a counter melody in a middle voice as the main melody leaps into a higher register. Nice piece. Really beautiful. The next piece is composed by the violinist Nigel Kennedy, who I believe is still known as simply Kennedy. He changed his name to just Kennedy. And Kroke, K-R-O-K-E. They are a, um, I hope I'm saying that right, they're a Polish klezmer band. And uh, Kennedy and Kroke uh, did this together. It's called Lullaby for Camilla. And this is uh, Sheku Kana Mason and Harry Baker on the piano. And the both of them arranged this work as well. Actually, Sheku Kana Mason played with Croak himself. He starts with a bass line in the cello, played pizzicato, while the piano plays the melody. This is a light dancing feel to it. At 57 seconds, this switches. The cello has the melody and the piano the accompaniment. The cello line is appealingly legato and loud in its higher end. The melody of this tune is immediately appealing, and the feel is caught well. It's got a rootsy quality to it without completely abandoning the formality of the classical environment. In other words, the performance is caught between two worlds, obliterating neither. And man, that's going to happen even more in the next album that we talk about. Oh, no. <laughs> that's an appealing quality um, to have that, to have both um, going at the same time. This melody is real poppy sounding as it is. Yeah. Um, you know, mm. it's catchy and almost like a pop song. Yeah. And in fact, the booklet notes say that uh, kind of that Sheku kind of Mason improvises on this track. I enjoyed the deep throaty open fifth that he plays at the end. All right, here we go. Here's a <laughs> classical <laughs> track. Hector Villa Lobos Preludio Modinha. W246, number two. This is from Bacchianas Brasileiras, number one, with Hannah Roberts, Ben Davies, Desmond Naismith, and Max Ruisi all playing cellos. This was arranged for five cellos by Simon Parkin. It was originally for eight cellos minimum, or really, oh. <laughs> cello orchestra. <laughs> minimum. Here we get five cellos. Everything had to be squeezed into five cellos. Kind of like a, I guess, a cello MP3, I guess. <laughs> Where you're just kind of compressing yeah. everything. It's an appealing sound, as you can imagine. The Bacchianas Brasileras are um, sort of inspired by Bach, which is why they have that name. But this sounds way too passionate in a romantic sense to be Bach-like to my ear. Sheku Kana Mason, she Sheku, apparently has the lead cello part. I believe that's him playing the main line double-stopped in the third minute. The piece is played in a supercharged, romantic manner. Fifth movement, Beethoven, 12 variations on Ein Mädchen oder Weibchen from the Magic Flute. And this is for cello and piano. And this is, uh, he's playing this with his sister, Isata Kane Mason on the piano. This brother and sister team take this theme in a straightforward fashion. And it's got a, they play with a matter of fact quality. It's a bit of a shock after the drawn out romanticism of the previous track. And I'm betting that he knew this was going to be here and they played it like this for that reason. Isata plays with little pedal and gets a fairly dry sound. And the first variation is a solo for her alone. Sheku comes in for the second variation. In fact, Isata gets the spotlight often in the set of variations. Uh, I like the way in the second minute she sprinkles the ending of the phrase onto the cello's opening of it. Sheku is especially ex expressive in his deep-toned variations in the sixth minute. It's amazing how far Beethoven can get from the original feel of the theme. All in all, the duo put across a performance that, like Beethoven, stands on the boundary between classical clarity of line and romantic deep emotion. Sixth track, Mendelssohn, Felix Mendelssohn, Song Without Words, number 25, opus 62, number one, arranged for cello and piano by Friedrich Grutzmacher. And this features Isata Kane Mason on the piano. So this was originally for solo piano, hmm. but I guess they've just taken the um, cello line out and... Uh, the melody out and arranged it for the cello. This has a rippling piano accompaniment supporting the cello melody. What's interesting about this is that the main melody is sometimes high in the piano, while the cello plays the melodic material 
when it's lower in the texture or it's brought lower by the arrangement. It's kind of hard to figure out what he's done here. I guess we have to go back to the original to hear it. Uh, sometimes he's in the high register as well, the cello. It's interesting to hear this solo piano work this way. Uh, the next track is uh, Mendelssohn again, Song Without Words for Cello and Piano, Opus 109, with Isata Kaname sitting on the piano again. Here, a straightforward accompaniment in piano and theme, and the theme is in the cello writing. This has an ostinato rhythm in the accompaniment through all the chord changes. At a minute and 38 seconds, there's a sudden roiling middle section where a good dynamic balance is kept between the duo. It makes me think they'd be good in the Franck Sonata, and I'd like to hear them play that. Mm. The opening material repeats afterwards. Track 8, Jules Massenet, Elegy from 20 Mel Melodies, Volume 1, Number 1. And this one has uh, Pumeza Matsushikaza on the soprano, where she's singing, and James Bayou on piano. And uh, there's no text for this song included in the CD booklet, but it's a famous song, and you can find them online along with translations. It's in French. The piano plays the gentle opening. Then the cello comes in with the melody, nicely shaped here, but not as affectionate as he was in the Welsh tune Mi Fan We at the beginning of the program. He reaches a climax, then the soprano comes in. She's got a deep-toned, heavy voice, despite being a soprano. It's a pretty unique sound that she makes, actually, with her voice. It kind of heavy. You don't only really think of sopranos as having a heavy tone, but she does. Um, the song is basically about how the good times are gone because the singer's love is gone. Yeah, we, <laughs> we can all relate, can't we? Anyway, track nine, Stravinsky, Chanson Russe from Mavra with Isata Kane Mason on piano here. This is a transcription by Stravinsky and Dmitry Markovich, and they, I think they played it together too. Astonato rhythm in the piano. I guess we would expect that from Stravinsky. Sudden change from the previous piece. Sheku shapes the Stravinskyan melody idiomatically, and one gets a sense of its Russian character from the way he plays it. There's a darkness to the tone, despite the ironic lightness of the rhythm. Uh, really interesting piece and appealing. Track 10, Johann Sebastian Bach, Come, Sweet Death, BWV 478. This features Hannah Roberts, Ben Davies, Desmond Naismith, and Max Ruisi on cellos. It's arranged for five cellos by... Sheku Kane Mason himself. We go right into this from the previous work with very little pause, if any. It's got no rhythm, and the beginning has a lamenting feel to it. I shouldn't say it has no rhythm. It doesn't have like a beat, let's say. Okay, it's just kind of stretched out. It's got a rhythm, though. It sounds like a chorale with the cellos drifting through chord voicings. There's a bit of counterpoint at times. The tone is warm, much more so than on the Villa Lobos work. All right, this is what the one I've been waiting for. Messian, Olivier Messian, Louange à l'Eternité de Jésus. This is um, praise for the um, eternity of Jesus. This is from the Quartet for the End of Time. And James Bayou is playing the piano on this one. And we get extreme sensitivity from both artists in this deeply searching movement of Messian's Quartet for the End of Time. The cello playing an endless legato melody and the piano marking time with repeated chords. Um, he's, he's on every quarter note, I believe. And that I don't think that changes for the entire piece. There's an appealing hush over the entire movement. And I particularly like Sheku's restraint here, which serves the movement well. It really pays off when he plays forte at the four minute mark with gorgeous warm vibrato. There's a gorgeous hush to his last long held tone at the very end. I mean, I've heard more probing, searching performances of this movement, but I like it this way. It's a performance a performance of the entire quartet with these two involved. It might be of interest. I would certainly want to hear it. Track 12, this kind of acts as a Bach again, so I guess you get a little, you get a little sandwich in the middle there with Messian in the middle. This is a Bach, Savior of the Nations, come, BWV 659. And this is for four cellos again. The other cellists are Hannah Roberts, Ben Davies, and Max Ruisi, and arranged by Sheku Kane Mason. Starts with a climbing staccato theme in the lowest voice, while the rest play overlapping harmonies via counter melodies. One voice emerges, but others take over. Lovely phrasing by the lead voice, whose phrase ends with a cadence at about the two minute mark. I like the hush that falls over the ensemble after three minutes and 30 seconds, leading to another crescendo and eventual cadence. All right, now we get into the uh, lighter part of the program here. 
Arthur Hamilton, Cry Me a River, um, with Harry Baker on the piano. And this is arranged by Sheku and Harry Baker themselves. This is a jazz tune and or a pop song, really, from uh, the 1940s, I guess. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald originally sang this for the film Pete Kelly's Blues. I'm sorry, the 1950s, in 1955. But it was dropped from the film, and uh, Julie London was the first to have her recording released, uh, singing it in the film The Girl Can't Help It a year later. And Ella recorded it later in her career. Here, the cello starts it out in the very low end, getting a rich tone as the piano sprinkles accompanying figures after his phrases. Uh, Sheku has soul and ends his phrases with blue-sounding notes. At the 57th second mark, the piano takes a theme in the high end as the cello accompanies gently. Then they trade the theme back and forth. The cello gets a powerful moment at around a minute and 30 seconds and takes over the melody afterwards. I like Sheku's um, final high note at 2 minutes and 10 seconds with the piano ending high in his register after a brief climb. Track 14, Friedrich Hollander, Falling in Love Again. And Hannah Roberts is playing the um, cello on this one. This is arranged by two cellos by Simon Parkin. Uh, Friedrich Hollander was a film composer, and this song was first sung by Marlene Dietrich in the mm. film The Blue Angel in 1930. Mm. Yeah. It starts out with a low cello melody, which becomes accompaniment, while the second cello plays the vocal line. Here, um, Sheku Kanemason is accompanying himself, apparently, via two-track. It's a nicely realized performance. No, no, he wouldn't be. I don't think he is, actually, because there's another cellist on this. It's a nicely realized performance with soft, heartfelt contours in the phrasing. At a minute and 45 seconds slow, Habanera-sounding dance rhythm starts as the theme continues in the upper cello. The opening repeats, lovely tapering off of the melody at the end. I take that back. He's not accompanying himself here. He's got a, Hannah Roberts playing the other mm. cello. Oh, well. It's a cello duo, duo. The next five tracks are by Edmund Finnis. They are his preludes one for, through five. And these were written specifically for Sheku Kane Mason. They're very short. All of them are less than two minutes. This, uh, the first one uh, stays mainly in the middle and low end of the instrument. It's got a theme whose melodic contour repeats through the piece. The second one starts very quietly with a repeating two-note figure in the low end, which eventually grows into a quickly arpeggiated figure. It's so fast, it's hard to make out what's in there. Listen to it on headphones. Prelude 3, track 17. This um, one features short phrases separated by pauses, like a folk song, and is also in the low end of the cello. Uh, Finnis apparently likes that sound as much as I do. I like the low end of things. I don't know. Certainly of uh, reed instruments, as we both yeah. have discussed. Prelude 4, long drawn out harmonic patterns created by one back and forth bow, then a new note. Basically, it's a main bass note and a harmonic, and it has a hypnotic effect. A prelude five is arpeggiated figures set the tone. This one finally breaks into the cello's upper range in the brief middle section. All five of these were simple yet intriguing. Track 20 is uh, by Zach Abel and Sheku Kane Mason. It's called Same Boat, and uh, they... I apparently did this for this um, recording. Zach Abel is the vocalist on this, and the two want the raw, intimate sound of Zach's voice along with the organic sounds of the cello to register here. All instrumental and percussion sounds are made by the cello. Uh, the vocal is recorded up close and has an R&B quality to the tone and phrasing. When I say R&B, I mean like from the 1960s R&B. I don't mean modern R&B. Um, it's kind of old school. The cello gets some deep bass thumps this could pass for a popular R&B song. It's immediately appealing. Sheku's stylings are creative and appealing, and I liked his angelic high harmonies. The sound quality of this track is very different than the rest of the album. It's very rich and present. And track 21 is uh, Sheku playing solo. Burt Bacharach, I Say a Little Prayer. Now, you might remember this song from Dionne Warwick singing it. She sang the original. And Aretha Franklin also sang it rather famously as well. Anyway, the accompaniment and melody all realized by a single cello are played pizzicato throughout. I don't think he's overdubbed himself here. I think he's actually playing all of this. Yeah, they're all realized by a single cello here. So um, he's playing it all live, I think, which is pretty impressive. Um, all of it's played pizzicato throughout. There's no bow mm. on this entire track. It's played as if it were a guitar, really, yeah. Yeah, really, yeah. And it catches the quality of the song well, too, despite that, you know. It's a charming ending. 
Okay, so really, this album attempts to do musically what we're attempting to do in this podcast, show that it's okay, and even normal, to enjoy a wide range of different genres of music and different types of music within those genres. We're not very um, strict about, you know, what adult music is, as long as an adult can enjoy it. (laughs) It's an eclectic album. There are no really big intellectual pieces on it, though the Messian is a nod to that. Uh, It's a great album for those who like the cello, and it's inventively programmed. Yeah, I thought the program is a bit of a mishmash. Hmm. And that's by intention, I think. I I think so. The Finnis, I didn't really care for that as much as a lot of the other stuff. That said, what I did like was really a lot of fun. And I thought it was kind of enjoyable because he's really expanding the ways that cello can be expressive. You know, there's a lot of variety of techniques with uh, the creative pizzicati and different ranges and his arrangements Oh, with the multiple cellos and other instruments are pretty creative. He's inventive as a player. Yeah. So I think yeah, you know, if you want to just have some variety of expression for cello and uh, in a number of settings, it, I think it would be really hard to get real continuity with this program. There are going to be some things that are just going to go in complete different directions. But if you approach it like that, sort of as uh, a variety package of things that he can do, it's pretty enjoyable. Yeah. He's got a name for himself so he can do something like this. It's kind of an artist-centered, almost poppy right. in a way kind of thing, which is cool. I'd like to hear like a more focused sort of a study of things from him in the future, too. Like kind of drilling down on one aspect of things to go in a little deeper, too. But I yeah, mean, I'm he's sure really young, so yeah, yeah. he's got plenty of time to do that kind of stuff. I think of people like Yo-Yo Ma who played, you know, all these weird creative programs and yet he did all the repertoire as well. He really played everything. And I really liked those uh, Appalachian things he did too. Those were a lot of fun. You know, he really got out of his element. He does that all the time, really. Yeah. Does Yo-Yo Ma. But I think uh, especially Sheku Kana Mason of all of them, seems like he'll do that quite quite a bit in his career. Well, I like this kind of new generation of players and... uh, like with Sean Shibe too. Uh, yeah. I think they they don't have this stuffiness towards, you know, what is classical music. And I think they get rid of a lot of the pretension that comes with it. Yeah, I think that's a bit of an issue too, because you know, there are a lot of people who like classical music and they want to know more about it, but they don't want to go into it because of you, you meet that one person who's really into classical music and they're really stuffy and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And they don't want to deal with that person. I, yeah. I've met a few of them myself and right. you can't get a word in edgewise when they're talking about uh, the great masterwork they're discussing or whatever. But yeah. you don't get that from the players. I mean, this is no, just no. gone, I think, you know, there's mm-hmm. a bit of a... Yeah, there's a bit of like a, a classiness to the to the performers. They 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 come across as very well educated, and not just musically. You know, what I mean, they kind of speak well and hmm. and all of this. But um, it, you know, in an elevated when I say speak well, I mean in an elevated way, not normally, not not like how we speak on this podcast, really. <laughs> you know, I I could never get a job as a classical music announcer talking like I do. <laughs> you know, so it's it's although I'm hoping to change the. Uh, yeah, the image of what a someone who talks about classical music is. I, it should just be like a an ordinary, an ordinary guy who knows something about it. Really, well, some of those you know? uh, big classical podcasts will put you to sleep in the first couple minutes. Yeah, and you know yeah. they sound uh, they actually sound like they don't really enjoy talking about the music. Either. Well, well some know, of them, so. the ones that are, I like the interview ones a lot. Like I, you know, mm. they're they can be better, but a lot of the ones that are. That I've heard, um, I'm not going to mention any names. There are one or two that um, they. I feel like they condescend to the uh, to the podcast listening audience. You know, they're kind of mm. like, oh, they're explaining everything. You know, mm. I mean, the audience needs to know something. But you have the internet; you can look stuff up. You know, <laughs> I yeah. mean, there's no need to really go into real detail about, mm. you know, just um, you, you know, to explain an opera or something. You can read a summary of it in Wikipedia pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it is good to know, though. I mean, things that I think that as an educator I can give people is just something about the era because people aren't going to know a lot about, you know, what was happening at the time a lot of these works were um, written or even when they were written, you know. So they don't really, you know, you just kind of point out things to listen for and things like that. Anyway, (laughs) the next track here, speaking speaking of uh, adventurous programs, well, 
This is a, an album called Where is Home and uh, subtitled in a, with um, Sesotho words, which is a language of South Africa. Hai Kekaye. I don't know if I've said that right. I have no idea what Sesotho sounds like, but we're going to have to say a lot of it if I'm going to talk about this album. This is by a young cellist by the name of, and I listened to a South African program that said his name, Abi Selauchoe. That's how apparently you say it. And a lot of other people. And I'm going to need the CD for this one because uh, I couldn't even list all the people on this album. There's so many. I didn't bother writing them down. So I'm going to try to let you know who they are as the album goes on. He's got quite an army of um, people recording this. Now, this really isn't a classical album, although it has certain classical elements. It's more of one of those crossover mm -hmm. albums. And um, I feel like records like this need a bit of um, sort of... I need to encourage listeners to hear it because I think albums like this can get lost. Although there are a lot of critics that are really praising it. I mean, I liked it enough too. And the reason why, and we talked about something about this this week that I didn't really say much about, but um, it leans more towards world music and what they mm -hmm. call or global. Now the Grammys want to call it global than classical. What I mean is it's, it's like the traditional music of South Africa in this case, and it's got classical in it too. Albums like this often get lost in the shuffle due to the difficulty in classifying them. Should classical listeners listen to this? You know, should people who are interested in African music listen to it? What I want to say is that adults should listen to it, and that's why it's perfect for this podcast. <laughs> okay? It's a shame that these, these records can't fall into a classification because there's often unclassifiable gems that are well worth hearing. And I think this is one of them. Um, adult music is the ideal place to be talking about an album like this, as I just said. Silao Choe is South African, and um, as the title suggests, the program explores the idea of seeking refuge, not in the stigmatized sense of the word associated with fleeing, but as a place that grounds us and empowers us. The booklet notes explain all the tracks in the highly personal voice of Silao Choe himself, and the sung texts are included in the CD booklet. Now, they're all in these African languages, mostly um, Sesotho with English translations. One of the things Salaucho says in this, um, in his notes is that he, South African people hear an affinity between Baroque era music, which we're going to hear a bit of on this album, and their own traditional music. And the reason that happens is because they sang hymns in church. And, you know, I, I think a lot of them came from or started in the Baroque era. And when I read that, that really kind of lit me up because there's a pretty famous piece that some listeners may know by Kevin Volans, the South African composer, called White Man Sleeps. And uh, it's made it was made famous by the Kronos Quartet back in the 1980s or early 1990s, and I can't really remember when. But it was originally written for Baroque-type instruments, a harpsichord, there was percussion, um, there was a viola da gamba. And what he did was set all these sort of South African themes and he put them on these instruments. And um, if you hear the string quartet version, which I think is a lot cooler, it doesn't, uh, the, the, the Baroque elements don't really come out as well. And whenever I used to play that, I loved that piece so much. And um, Bruce Chatwin also apparently liked uh, Kevin Volans' music, the, um, the author who was really popular at the time. He wrote a book called The Song Lines. When I, when I played that for people that I knew, they were really into roots music and they just would say, oh, I just want to hear this as its original folk in its original folk element. And my complaint about that is, well, you can, you know, they, that's all over the place, but this is something really unique. And I think it's, you know, worth, uh, worth hearing. I love that piece, by the way. Check that out. Kevin Volans, White Man Sleeps. You can hear the Kronos Quartet version. Really, there are three or four recordings of it out there and they're all good. Mm. So I would recommend any one of them. I love that piece so much. Anyway, this album kind of um, gets a bit of that quality to it. And I think there, there's a bit of truth to that uh, idea of Baroque music and South African music having a strange sort of affinity to each other, which is interesting. It, it's not complete. I mean, the, South African music doesn't move in that kind of mechanical way that Baroque music does. But um, nevertheless, they... The, the cultures um, combine a bit. Anyway, the first track on this is called um, Ibuyile i Africa, which means Africa is back. This features Yo-Yo Ma on guest cello. 
And that title, by the way, the language is Isi Zulu, and it's a traditional hymn that was sung in apartheid times about the struggle to conquer the apartheid regime. Uh, the hymn tells the youth that now it is time to define our voice, to cherish our own traditions, and create the Africa we want for our children. Uh, Salaucho says this arrangement is an ode to Desmond Tutu. I want to say also that all of these African pieces are very, very positive in their in their lyrics and their meaning. Anyway, the other musicians on this besides Yo-Yo Ma, we have Simran Singh, Max Bailey on violins, Colin Alexander on cello, Fred Thomas on piano, Alice Zawadzki, Shafiz Adams Burnett, and Than Danani Umede are all singing. They're the voice. One of the things that um, Salaochoa, the cellist, does is uh, he starts a lot of these pieces with harmonics on the cello, and I really love that sound. And he starts this one like that. There's a light sprinkling of piano texture while he's doing this. The hymn comes across as warm and wistful in the cello. It's a slow piece, moving like a slow-paced church hymn. Uh, Salaochoa sings on this too. He's got a rich, warm baritone, and it is kind of African-sounding in its phrasing. There's kind of like a I don't even know how to describe it, but an African kind of flexibility to it. There, it's not something that, say, an American like singer would would do. It's 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 really got a very specific African cultural quality to the way he phrases. There are harmony voices as well in this, and when he sings, he, the cello, and the accompanying singers all follow in parallel harmony, which may annoy some listeners. Um, the solo cello parts are atmospheric. I liked it though. Improvising on the hymn theme in the third and fourth minutes, and the performance is deeply heartfelt. The second track, Dipolelo, which means like, I guess, a receipt or improvisation, is a solo for Salacho himself. It's 45 seconds long, and it features the flexible rhythmic phrasing I've heard in South African songs, and this is over before it really begins. The third track, one that I really liked, is called Zawose, and it's dedicated to Hukwe Zawose. He was one of Tanzania's legendary traditional musicians, Hukwe Savose Morogoro. Tanzania was a place of refuge for South Africans in exile, where they organized and strategized the overthrow of apartheid. One of Savose's songs, Mateso, meaning suffering, is a reference to the tribulation of South Africans in the time of apartheid. And Salao Choya himself wanted to respond to the song with one of his own to say, thank you for the love, kindness, and empathy. And that's what this is. A salachoa here tries to translate the zeze, an instrument with a single beaten string, to the cello in this piece. This uh, track has richly recorded percussion. Um, if you have good speakers, it'll just really... It sounds like it's in the room. It's pretty fantastic. Salachoa plays the opening all on harmonics, which I really love. He sings vocals as well, uh, this time with a raspy aggressiveness in his voice. The lyrics thank Zavose for helping South Africans in the time of struggle and say that the beauty of Africans is infinite and the path of all Africans is love, a love that moves forward. This is as optimistic as lyrics come. I liked Salaucho's cello playing between his sung verses on this one, playing double stopped lines in parallel harmony. The recording is impressively vivid, especially the bass in the fourth minute. Um, a lot of Salaucho's harmonic playing reminds me of Elements of Volan's work, White Man Sleeps, as I mentioned uh, earlier, which tells me it's got something in common to South African culture. Tracks four through seven are a Baroque cello sonata by Giovanni Benedetto Platti, a composer I have never heard of before. This is his cello sonata number seven, sorry, cello sonata number seven in D. First moon is Adagio, and I should mention Zavose, um, the... Uh, Performers were Simran Singh on violin, Max Bailey on viola, Colin Alexander cello, Alice Zawadzki, Cherise Adams Burnett, Thandanani Gumede singing vocals, Alan Kiri electric bass, Siddiqui Dembele, Jembe, and uh, another instrument there, and Marmadou Sayer on congas and talking drum, Fred Thomas on high percussion. Oh, Cal Calabash? Oh, wow. Okay, Siddiqui, Dembele, and Calabash, and Djembe. Okay, now, Giovanni Benedetto Platti work, we have Selachoe on cello, Elizabeth Kenny on the Theorbo, Kadiali Koyate on the Kora, which is a sort of um, African harp, and Fred Thomas on the double bass. 
that's re- rather unusual for a for baroque cello sonata but he's able Sacho is is trying to sort of give us his take on these um the way these are heard in his culture he claims that baroque music and south african music uh, have more in common than you might expect as I mentioned, this Kevin Volan's piece, White Man Sleeps, um, they collided long ago in South Africa's history in the church where European hymns and African music began to occupy the same space. So Lao Choi chose this work for its improvisatory quality, which suits his way of playing. Yeah, he's he kind of seems like one of those types that won't keep to the uh, the score. Like he's got an idea, he's going to play it. And he's more improvisational. Improvisations are interpolated between the movements of this sonata. Um, the accompaniment gives what would normally be a smooth, stretched-out accompaniment, moving smoothly from chord to chord, a bit of rhythmic spice. There's a light percussive quality to it that we ordinarily wouldn't hear if this was a Western ensemble. Uh, so Lao Choi's playing leans toward traditional Baroque, but this is a cellist steeped in a love for his own culture, as well as the Baroque hymns he sang and heard in church. And he's very much his own musician with his own ideas, interpreting this as he would have heard it in his culture, rather than following... A more academic approach, let's say. Track five is the uh, second movement, um, Allegro. It sounds like it was originally a rather square theme, and Salachoe puts that across, but again, there's a bit of an exaggerated quality to the rhythm that is Salachoe's own um, addition. The rhythm sounds counted as though exaggerated so that dancers can follow it, if you know what I mean. Third movement, Largo, is fairly straightforward. It sounds like a typical Baroque Largo movement, but Salaucho's phrasing makes it just a bit less melancholy. There are also little ad-libs like the harmonics at around a minute and 40 seconds, and the chorus solo at a minute and 50 seconds, which takes the piece out of the Baroque for a moment. The movement paradoxically has the melancholy of a Largo and the cheer of a South African theme at the same time. All right, this, this, this piece is not for, this performance is not for purists. <laughs> But it's an appealing take, I have to say. The movement connects to the next via an improvised bridge. And the fourth movement, presto, perhaps the most cheerful jig I've ever heard. Salaucho, it's almost like he senses this, there's a rhythm there and he's got to really dig into it. He and his accompanists make this rhythm jump high. I like the way the false cadence just before the first minute at a minute and 12 seconds still manages to come out along with the high stepping rhythm and theme. This was a highly appealing uh, performance of this movement. And one like you'll never hear it played by a Western ensemble. Okay, we well get back to the uh, the more South African uh, pieces here. Lokomela, which means take care, that is sesotho. The sense of the piece is of people far from home hanging out together despite their differences. Sort of like us in Japan, I guess. So we're back in Africa with Salaucho's singing. This has a lively rhythm of the sort of those of us who've heard Paul Simon's Graceland album may recall. I like the way the electric bass in African music is so thick and one note melts into the other in a way that goes beyond simple legato. At 2 minutes and 40 seconds, there's a slower interlude with no percussion, but the percussion quickly comes back and livens things up. Track 9, Kwawe, Sesotho for hero. This is dedicated to Sela Choe's nephew. It speaks of finding refuge in the playfulness and infectious energy and spirit of children. This has a drawn-out double-stopped chords, many chords, from the cello to start the piece. They're a bit on the heavier side. There are vocal improvisations on sounds at even a Tuvan throat-singing type vocal at a minute and 20 seconds. Slouchoy makes percussive sounds with his vocals along with the percussion as the cello plays a melody. His vocals are pretty aggressive in this piece with a rough edge to the tone. It's very appealing, of course. He improvises over the rhythm at the end of the fourth minute of the on the cello. So track 10 is uh, Sesoto Lerato, Lerato, which is Sesoto for love. It's a slow vocal track that Salaochoa sings in a breathy voice, the first time we've heard this approach on the album. And the text describes the love that comes from the infinite. A solid percussive rhythm underlines the cello solo and Salaochoa is singing. An easy track to drift off into happy thoughts to. The next track is called uh, Sepone, which means mirror, and this features Salaucho's solo. It starts um, on the harmonics of the cello, as we've heard many times on this album. It's sung as well in a passionate tone. The text for this is not included in the booklet. I really enjoyed the rhythm that Salaucho plays starting at the minute and 31 second mark, and it ends rather unexpectedly. 
Track 12, Johann Sebastian Bach, of all people, is from his cello suite number three, uh, BWV 1009-1009. This is the fourth movement, Saraband, so the slow movement. Salacho really digs into the opening notes of this piece. He goes for a rough tone here, which is very different than the tradition would have you hear it. And he, he sings the theme at one point while accompanying himself with pizzicati. <laughs> Uh, this is not your common Bach, but Bach's music has a way of giving up new dimensions when different approaches are applied. And I was interested to hear this played in this free manner. In the second minute, Salaucho plays the piece in a traditional style in the cello, but he's more interested in capturing a certain feeling than on the than building on the tradition built up in this piece. He's he's really got his own take. Third movement, third, um, track thir thirteen. Sorry, invocation. It's a brief male vocal harmony underlined by a sliding, droning, double-stopped cello line. And I apparently I've stopped talking about the many musicians on this album. It's just as well, I guess. They deserve um, credit, though. Let's see. Track 14, Ka Bohaleng on the sharp side. Here the uh, Sesotho language title features to a Sesotho saying that a woman holds the knife on the sharp side, or by the blade. Um, it conjures an image of bravery, strength, and an understanding of pain an image depicting the uh, courage, liveliness, initiative, and sacrifice of mothers everywhere. Let me go back to listing the uh, musicians. Sela Choe is on cello and voice. Rock Vinder Singh and Simran Singh on violins. Ruth Gibson, viola. Alice Zawadzki, voice. Alan Kiri, electric bass. Siddiqui Dembele, Calabash and Jembe. Mamadou Sar, congas and talking drum. And Fred Thomas, high percussion. Okay, so the previous piece, The Invocation, was an introduction to this. It has an aggressive rhythm to it, powerfully impactful on the recording. Salachoy sings powerfully in his rough-edged tone, injecting throat singing sounds as well. He's leaning towards Felakuti territory here. Uh, the rhythm and bass at the end of this shook the house, despite the moderate volume I had it at. Track 15, Johann Sebastian Bach, cello suite number 5 in C minor, BWV 1011. This is the fourth movement, Saraband. Um, here, this one's a little more of a traditional approach. Salacho starts off with a mournful, lonely quality. His sound has a bit of an edge to it, and he has a way of isolating each note in the melody rather than kind of like putting them together as a string of notes into a long line, like a string of pearls maybe. Um, he doesn't really blend them together. It works well, though. Uh, he's very musical, and which is why it works well. It's how he hears music, I guess. I found the approach engaging and very different than what we normally hear. And please, that doesn't mean better or worse. It just means different. Track 16, Ancestral Affirmations. This features Selao Choe on voice and percussion, Fred Thomas on percussion, and the Selao Choe family as the other voices. But they're kind of dropped into the, the mix. I think they're recorded at a different time and were just sort of included in this. This features harmonized male vocals at the beginning. Uh, the family's contribution to this piece is mostly multi-track talking as the melodizing by the male's voices continues. And it may all be Salacho himself overdubbed. At 2 minutes and 37 seconds, a heavy percussive rhythm begins under the continuing ostinato theme to the vocal. At the end of the track, the rhythm dissolves into the Selachoe family singing, and that's how the album ends. This was more of a studio experiment than the other works on the album. But it's a good ending to the album. Um, one of this is really a crossover album. It's not a, you shouldn't think of it as a classical album, but it's it's getting quite a buzz out there. the The record though can't help but be cheerful and appealing. It's not heavy at all, and Salachoy himself is quite a phenomenon, bursting not only with cello but vocal talent. I'd be curious to hear him in a straightforward classical concerto on the cello, just to hear how he approaches that element. Um, this album is acting as his calling card. It's his first album. And it's not only impressive, but bursting with joy in music making. And it's definitely not an album for purists. Um, so if you're here for the classical element, you, you'll want to give this a pass. But I think you'll be uh, missing out on something. It's uplifting, which is something we normally don't get to hear. It's a unique album that really presents an antidote to the times we live in. And I'd recommend hearing it. I think it was it's really something very different than what we normally hear. Yeah, I didn't know what to make of this, really. Mm -hmm. uh, now that you've explained kind of the 
context of the classical music in South Africa and how they mm. experienced it, it makes a little more sense to me. Because uh, I really like South African music a lot, and we've done a little sort of South African jazz on uh, episodes in the past too. So it was really hard for me to figure out what that context with these classical pieces are. And yeah. rather for me, I felt like I just wanted to hear more South African <laughs> type of uh, That things. generally happens, right? Yeah. yeah. But knowing that, you know, really there's got to be a, a limit to how much cello you can work into those uh, traditional <laughs> kind of things. I was amused by it. The vocal numbers, the, the growling was a bit over the top. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it was he, he does get like, a bit aggressive at points, yeah. I did find that arrangement of the Baroque piece rather unique with the instrumentation. It certainly was, yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, we could probably imagine experiences like this in different cultures, you know, like how did the Chinese first take to Western classical music and right. incorporate that into their musical lives or something? I know a bit about how Europe Europeans first took to like the Beijing opera in China and the answer is not well. I mean it took a lot of time. The 19th century romantics didn't like it at all cuz they figured they were the best ever. Right. But now we have a bit of a context for it. We kind of know a bit about it and we appreciate it as a cultural thing. Those of us who really like yeah. the arts anyway. Yeah, right. So I guess if you if you take this as a uh, kind of crossover world music infused with western classical music and the cultural take on that and where it would fit in with traditional music. It's kind of an interesting journey, not for purists, as you say, mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, it's certainly got a lot of uh, variety and uh, interesting stuff going on in it. Yeah, I feel like I want to say one thing about it, though. This album sounds like it's about him. You know, it's, it doesn't, he's not really, I mean, it. what he does is appealing and people will like it if they hear it, but I don't feel like mm. he's like making this for an audience. He's making it more for him and the audience is just going to, appreciate it and like yeah. it it really does sound like he's kind of indulging at times but yeah. uh it's all appealing though it's really yeah, nice fair it's, enough. It's, yeah. yeah and there you go i guess that's the uh the cello and we've done a nice kind of a crossover into jazz here with this sort of um crossover album into uh world yeah. music and now we're gonna jump into a lower frequency range we're gonna drop down even lower the program for all bass led groups this evening i had some yeah uh, quite a few on the list, and I thought, well, let's uh, do that and uh, get some bass leaders out. Because, you know, bassists think about music differently because they look from the bottom up. And even in the pop music world, some of the most interesting songwriters are bassists because they see possibilities that are different than, I think, pianists and guitarists do. Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson being two of the most famous examples, but there are a lot of others. And so, yeah, how do bassists conceive tunes and decide on arrangements. It's kind of interesting way to look at things. So we're going to start with a young bassist, Alexander Claffey, and his new release came out in October called Music from Big Orange. And this is on Cellar Live. And I was attracted by some of the players on here when I saw Randy Brecker's name and Dave Kikoski, uh, one of our hmm. favorite pianists as well. So Claffey is just turned 30 this year. He's from uh, the greater Philadelphia area, and he started with electric bass and then switched to upright bass as well. His father was a band leader and his mother a singer, so he had an early exposure to music, and he attended the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music. He played around New York and Philadelphia area with uh, pianists Oren Evans, George Burton, and uh, also drummer Justin Faulkner, Wayne Smith Jr. He moved to New York in 2011, and he's worked with a lot of big names now. Uh, Jimmy Cobb, Louis Hayes, Harold Mayburn, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Christian Scott, Joey Alexander, Wallace Rooney, and many more. And in just the past three years, he's uh, recorded on Verve, High Note, Positone, Ropa Dope, La Reserve record labels. And now he's on Seller Live. And I have to say thanks to Mr. Seller Alive himself, Corey Weeds, who we've consulted mm. before. That was the Brian Charette album, wasn't it? Right. Where we had a confusion on tracks. So the credits on this recording were a mystery to me because the there's no CD yet, as I can tell. The streaming release has seven tracks, uh, but if you go to Bandcamp, there's only credits for the musicians for five tracks. Well, rather there's multiple people playing the same instrument on the album and it has like track one, two and so forth. 
Uh, so I said, okay. So I, I went to Seller Live's page and they have listing for six tracks, <laughs> but still not <laughs> seven. And I can tell there's going to be a vinyl release of this coming out. And that only has five tracks probably for time constraints. But which track was which, I was getting more confused <laughs> by the moment. Uh, so I wrote to actually both Claffy and Corey Weeds and uh, Corey Weeds replied to me and there was a little problem with the file but we got it all cleared up and so I got all of the listings. Now from the album notes that Corey Weed sent me as well, basically in summary, uh, this is kind of a kind of expansive project for him in this recording because rather than a musician being sort of pigeonholed as a certain role, like in his case just a jazz bassist, he wanted to explore and express more sides of his whole musical nature. So here we get some of his original compositions, also original lyrics as well. And uh, to match his sort of conception, he's kind of handpicked musicians for each track to sort of shape and get what he wants out of each composition. And so he's here, uh, Claffy himself, on both electric and acoustic bass on this recording. Uh, we've got some vocalists, Kate Martucci, and we've got Alita Moses, uh, Sunny Step is another vocalist on one track here. We've got the great Seamus Blake on tenor sax and Iwi, the electronic wind instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy Brecker on trumpet, Eden Leiden on piano, Dave Kakoski on piano and Fender Rhodes, Mathis Picard on piano and Fender Rhodes, Kush Abade drums, Adam Aruda drums, and Aaron Kimball on drums. So you can see why I wanted to know who was playing on each track. <laughs> yeah. You should mention, again, Randy Brecker is on this album, and we're going to hear him. Man, and he sounds great. 76 yeah. years old. He hasn't wow. lost anything. He's still got the chops and still playing very creatively. Hmm. So we're going to start out the program with uh, Michelle Legrand composition, Once Upon a Summertime. It's a really lovely tune. Uh, here, the vocals are by Katie Martucci. Let's see, we've got Abaday on drums, Kikoski's on Fender Rhodes here, uh, Cluffy Electric Bass, and Randy Brecker on trumpet. This one starts with a real wash of phasey Rhodes from Kikoski and Randy Brecker improvisations on Harmon muted trumpet. It's very rubato uh, with a repeated low bass note growing underneath. It sounds like there's some low acoustic piano notes added in there as well to the roads, and Abade contributes swelling cymbal textures. Kokoski adds some high acoustic piano trickles as well before Claffy starts a slow and sure bass pulse in tempo just before a minute into the tune. Now this tune is originally in 3-4 time, but they give it a kind of 6-beat funky feel in the bass pulse and uh, drum feel. Uh, Martucci comes in on the lyrics, sounding floaty and dreamy over the syncopated pulse of Claffy, uh, who also adds some really nice fills at the ends of the vocal lines. Uh, Abade is helping Claffy to work it up into a more and more funky groove. Brecker gets another eight bar kind of uh, space to fill with more solo lines, and then Blake gets a longer tenor solo around the song form, Claffy adding more funky bass lines and fills underneath. Blake always sounds inspired whenever he picks up his horn, so I can see why everyone wants him to play on their recordings. Uh, he works it up into an intense climax and brings it back down softly. And Brecker gets another trumpet interlude, and then Kokoski is up for a big Rhodes solo. There's a lot of distortion on the sound of this Rhodes, uh, and he mixes mm. ringing melodic lines with some more percussive figures, tension-building harmonic dissonance in there too. Abaday and Claffy really lock in with some syncopated accents that drive Kikoski's solo to the end. Then Brecker gets another uh, interlude to settle it back into another round of the verse from Martucci. Uh, they take it out with an extended ending of Brecker and Blake trading and intertwining solo lines over the heavy groove of Claffy, Abaday, and Kikoski until it fades out. Yeah, it's a studio fade, too. It's not a yeah. natural fade. Normally, I'm always kind of complaining about when jazz pieces fade out. But this one, it was so busy that yeah. um, there was just no way out, <laughs> yeah. I feel like. So I guess they faded it on. I couldn't figure out how they possibly could have gotten out of that yeah. that uh, big, uh, complex uh, thing that they were doing. So, um, yeah, interesting grooves and feels on a very old classic tune. Now we're going to get the Cluffy original, starting with Your Flowers. And this is Martucci again on vocals. 
Blake and Brecker are back on the horns. Chris Abade on drums. And we're going to switch to uh, Mathis Picard on piano and Fender Rhodes and Claffy on electric bass. It starts out with an eight bar intro of legato horn phrases from Brecker's still muted trumpet and Blake's tenor sax. Picard has ringing Rhodes chords, uh, a much cleaner tone than we heard on the last track. And Abade has busy, tight snare work going on that contrast with the fluid horn lines. Uh, Martucci comes in with the lyrics. It's a simple, catchy melody to start, but lifts as it goes. There are two verses, each seem to be 18 bars. Uh, interestingly, if you count it, there's an extra two beats after bars six and bars eight. So you get like a six beat measure that gives mm. the flow of the melody kind of a feel of hesitation. Uh, the lyrics seem to be remembering a past love from youth. I like this one line that's in there. Uh, Somewhere in the end of time in a land that we could never find is a flower that belongs to you in a grave we knew was dug too soon. People saw the writing too. Oh, God, that's mm. pretty powerful. Yeah, so there's <laughs> the your flowers kind of explanation. Hmm. Uh, Abade keeps the that busy snare going on underneath the melody for cool effect. It's a real kind of tight thing that contrasts with the flowing lyrics. Uh, the end of the lyrics has a repeating all gone phrase, and from there it picks up into a heavier groove, uh, with Martucci continuing on with some vocalizations together with Blake's tenor joining in in unison. Uh, Picard has switched to acoustic piano, and he really pounds it out over the groove. Blake and Brecker get some furious solo exchanges with Brecker using his electric trumpet effects that you might remember back from the old uh, Brecker Brothers days. And uh, they work up to playing together, and Martucci adds vocalizations on top. Claffy's got intense bass lines underneath it all, locking in really good with Abide, and they don't let up on the intensity, but it fades out to <laughs> a studio fade. But again, the same situation. It's re this really complex... Uh you know, chaotic sort of playing going on. And there's really no way out of that as well. Yeah. yeah. So I haven't heard, I've heard a lot of Randy Brecker recently because he's playing on everybody's album as a guest. Uh, yeah. But I haven't heard that old electric trumpet tune. Uh, I got lucky. Let's see, when was it? It had to be like 93 or 94, just before I had left New York. I went down to the Terrytown Theater to see the reunion of the Brecker brothers. So I got to see them together. Mm -hmm. Uh, one time, and I saw Michael Brecker here in Osaka once after that. Track three, another Claffy original, Julia's Lullaby. Again, Martucci on voice, and we've got Blake on tenor, Adam Aruda on drums, Picard's still on piano here, and Claffy's over on acoustic bass on this tune. There's a very pretty piano opening from Picard. It's rubato with lots of space. Martucci enters with the lyrics and delicate rising melody. She has a very clear and pure tone quality to her voice. It's still rubato and slow, but there are some tricky rhythmic phrases that they sync together. Claffy joins in, adding a steady pulse, and Ruda is next on drums. There are several verses. I think they're like 16 bar length, and there's an ending phrase that really catches you that says, I wish we were living in kinder times. Hmm. Um, this is kind of like you know, lament in there. Uh, Blake gets a tenor solo, smoldering with intensity and darting lines, with Claffy's bass ringing out below. Uh, Martucci returns with uh, two more verses, more intensity in her voice now as Blake continues blowing on behind. It turns quiet with just Picard and Claffy to end it softly with the final strain. Just uh, bass and piano there. Four, Cheltenham for Randy and Michael, in parentheses. So obviously the Brecker Brothers, a dedication uh, for another Claffy original tune. And here Blake's got his uh, tenor in Iwi, and Randy Brecker is back on here too. We Back to Kush Abade on drums. Yeah, I was actually wondering what that instrument was yeah. when I heard it. I was yeah, like, it sounds oh boy. full on like a synthesizer. We've got uh, Picard on piano and Fender Rhodes, and Claffy electric bass with auxiliary keyboards. So we get a funky now with a heavy groove from Abade and Claffy and some intense chiming piano from Picard. Listen to how they mix up on the beat on the intro. Pretty intense stuff there. And I think uh, this mel the melody is on Iwi, but it could be a uh, synth here. The groove picks up with a lot of drive. Uh, there are cool change-ups of feel and dynamics under Blake's 
what I think is Blake on the melody, uh, blowing in great fills from Picard. Uh, then Brecker gets a solo round next on his synthy trumpet sound. He keeps it rhythmically funky, uh, but takes some interesting harmonic diversions that build tension. Uh, he really sounds just as great as he ever did. Uh, Blake is back with a and maybe this is just the uh, E we hear, but the tone is different. The solo is really synthy sounding, uh, fun pitch bends, and a few outer space effects uh, thrown in there too. Uh, Cluffy's laying down some mean bass with fast repeated notes underneath. Picard gets an acoustic piano solo next, making it super rhythmic and funky, but he does explore some kind of harmonically dangerous ideas too. Uh, it builds to a frantic climax with Abaday and Claffy getting busy underneath and Blake and Brecker return for a unison run through the melody together. Furious fills from Abaday and Blake gets a final few flourishes on the Iwi to finish it off. Track five is a Wayne Shorter tune, Plaza Real. And we've got uh, Blake and Brecker back. Uh, drummer on this track is Aaron Kimmel. We've got Dave Kikoski on piano and uh, Picard on keyboards too and uh Cleffy's on electric bass on this tune great piano intro on this one from kikoski cascades of notes and forward pressing chords ending with some pretty chimes after about a minute and 20 seconds where kimmel leads in with a processional beat on the snare uh, Cleffy adds some deep ringing electric bass blake and brecker float in some soft atmospheric phrases and trills picard has a subtle washy kind of synthy sound adding to Kikoski's ringing piano chords that fills out the atmosphere of the song. Uh, just before two minutes, it kicks into the tune with harmonic movement and Blake taking the melody, Kimmel keeping the procession going on snare. Brecker takes over for the next strain on trumpet before Blake comes back, and then they join together and trade off phrases, lifting it up higher. Blake gets a solo first over the dreamy landscape of sound, and he weaves intense lines and zipping phrases. Claffy has some great fills and rhythmic stuff going on underneath, so make sure you keep one ear on the bass uh, when you're listening to this. Uh, Brecker follows, starting softly uh, as the keyboard wash sort of quiets down. Uh, he works his phrases higher and higher with fun rhythmic figures and a show of that kind of a higher laser tone he can get in this kind of high trill he throws in his solo sometimes. Blake returns with the melody and Brecker continues around it, uh, ticking over again and then working together as things get quieter. And they continue on with some trumpet and bass doodles as it comes to a soft ending. Uh, track six, A-G. This one's a little bit uh, hard to uh, put into words. Uh, hmm. We've got Eden Layden on piano, Alita Moses on voice, and then the singer who goes by Sonny Step, I guess his real name is Michael Stevenson, uh, adds another voice. Adam Aruda on drums and Cluffy on electric bass. Soft and smoky vocals over this sort of music box chiming. It's like a synthy piano tone from Leiden. It's not acoustic piano. It's not a celesta? Kind of sound like be. a celesta. It sounds like a bit celesta yeah. kind of tone. Uh, mm. Cluffy joins in on bass, giving a rhythmic push, and Aruda joins with some clicky kind of drum sounds. There's some synthy reverb effect tones in the mix there before Leiden gets an acoustic piano solo. Uh, the vocals return with two voices. I guess this is Stevenson adding in, but he's really in, he has a very high voice. You know, you could think it's another female voice. There's a line, little did I know it was a dream when you came clean. Oh, that's kind of an interesting line in there. Uh, <laughs> there are vocalizations with an alternating semitone between E and F when they get to the end of the phrase. Uh, the bass follows that, and they sort of just repeat on that idea to the end. Now, there's also a strange ringing pulse. It sounds like a cymbal vestige or something in the left channel. It's very soft. You will only hear it in headphones, maybe. Yeah, I didn't hear it. Okay. This tune somehow seems like unfinished to me, or it just has a kind of a hard kind of quality to it to describe. Hmm. I have to listen to it some more because I didn't have time to really focus out on all the lyrics as well. I have to say, I'm pretty impressed by your description of the first, the, the previous five tracks. I thought they were really complicated. <laughs> it was a lot of hard to explain. Yeah. yeah. And then we end up with a Claffy original 1421 Sansom. This has got Blake on tenor, Abaday on drums, uh, Picard on piano, Claffy on acoustic bass. 
This one begins with a solo acoustic bass intro from Claffy. Uh, drums and ringing piano join in with Blake uh, adding sax to the free-flowing sound that fades over Claffy's bass pulses. Uh, a funky modal piano riff from Picard breaks out and gives it a, a rhythmic feel that's joined by Abade's drums and Claffy's bass. It completely changes character then to a light swinging theme as Blake comes in on the melody, but the riff section returns again. So Blake gets a solo over the progression of this contrasting sort of Latin feel on the modal section and then a more swinging section that has uh, more of chord progressions to it. Uh, Picard gets an interesting piano solo of rhythmic left hand trills and running two hand figures. Blake returns with the melody blowing softly and then getting animated over the rhythmic modal section to some real high wailing. Abade is mixing up the drumming uh, to feed him on with intensity. Uh, it simmers down keeping on with the syncopated modal groove and some final piano thoughts from Picard uh, until Abadek ends it uh, with some last drum hits. So there's a lot of uh, variety of material here. It shows off the different sides to Claffy's musical nature. I think I'll have to listen to it more to get inside some of the songs, especially the vocal numbers, because only the lyrics aren't available for most of the tunes, just the Michel Legrand tune, but I already know those uh, lyrics. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of impressive bass playing and grooves on both acoustic and electric bass from Claffy. Kikowski and Picard provide some really tasty and energetic keyboard work. Blake blows intensely as always, and it was fun to hear Randy Brecker with his uh, electronic effects of the old uh, Brecker brother days. So I guess Claffy's getting to stretch out and, you know, explore some other sides of music creativity here. And it's kind of interesting, uh, ma really awesome and massive bass playing. So any bass players <laughs> who want to uh, check out, especially the way that he sort of interweaves with the drummers, the, the bass and drum communication is really good. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm a former bass player myself, so I really appreciate this. He's a really busy bass player. He plays, he, yeah. he walks around a lot. It's pretty amazing. I, of course, went to the... Uh, the Johnny Thunders school of bass playing. <laughs> and uh, mo most of those classes were about uh, how to how to look super cool by having your extra long straps so that the, the bass is <laughs> near your knees. knees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, what you said about, you know, I'll have to listen to this a few more times. That's what I was thinking about it while I was hearing it. I was like, <laughs> boy, this is, this, this is a really busy record. And it's, it's going to take a few listens to really even start to grasp and for that reason i wish it was on cd because i would i would buy it and listen mm. to it for that reason i mean you could always hear it on i mean i won't buy an mp3 but you know i'd stream it but i just forget about things on streaming i like having the all cd right. and i'll just listen to it and you're in the stereo and stuff like that mm. yeah claffy um he's a, he, he moves around a lot on the bass and i really appreciated that uh the sort of the rest of the ensemble by the way they move around a lot too mm. so you wind up with this kind of you know, controlled chaos, which sometimes becomes really exhilarating. Um, I singled out the the composition Cheltenham for that. I really oh, right. liked yeah. that. Yeah, and also the ending of the first two tracks, which both fade out. I I almost kind of wish they could have gone on for like six more minutes. Like, <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah. really, you know, get my ear into that. You know, it almost uh, they take. I almost feel like they took it away before I could really right. figure out what was going on. But I liked it, and this, you know, it's not a record like. I, maybe I will love it one day, but you hear it one time and it's like, it kind of grabbed me intellectually and I wanted to kind of like hear mm -hmm. it again and again. So I liked it enough to want to get a CD. So if this ever comes out on a CD, uh, Alexander Claffey, write to us and let us know because I think I'll be first in line for that. Huh. I'll let you know because yeah. I often look at the um, yeah. Seller Live uh, page. Okay, that'd be cool. Yeah. Got a lot of releases I may forget. Out. Yeah. 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 This next one, I kind of wish was on a CD too, but because I yeah. liked this one. This is probably my favorite one, actually, which I'm going to talk about now. Okay. Yeah. So next we've got <clears throat> Santi Debriano and Orchestra Bembe with Ashanti. This is on Jojo mm. Records. Now, these next two are fresh recordings. This just came out on November 18th, uh, yeah. so just last week. So Santi Wilson Debriano is from Panama, born in 1955, but he was raised in Brooklyn. In yeah. Brooklyn? Yeah, in Brooklyn. Like me? Yeah, like you. Uh, yeah, we have so much in common. <laughs> with his family at age four, right? Yeah. Uh, but he studied composition at Union College in New York. I was up in yeah. my neck of the woods. Uh, in Debriano, he could have lived on my block. I don't know. Yeah. With a name like that. 
Uh, <laughs> then he attended the New England Conservatory of Music and Wesleyan University. Uh, he worked with Archie Shepp in the 70s and 80s. Then he moved to Paris, playing with Sam Rivers, and came back to New York City and has uh, since worked with a lot of big names, uh, Chucho Valdez, Hank Jones, Cecil Taylor, Randy Weston, Sonny Fortune, real favorite alto player of mine, Freddie Hubbard, Kirk Lightsey, and many others. So he's uh, had a lot of small groups in the late 1980s and also a world music-influenced ensemble, which had some uh, famous members in it too. And now he was also the music director for arts at Dwight Morrow High School in Inglewood, New Jersey, and was given an award for jazz education from New York University in 2001. So big resume and uh, an interesting recording here. All the compositions and arrangements are his, as well as this huge sounding uh, acoustic bass, uh, real big presence. Uh, we've got Andrea Brockfeld on flute, who contributes a lot to this recording. TK Blue on alto saxophone, who has also on his own solo release out this week, and is really good. I'm going to try to get that into a sax episode. Uh, okay. Tommy Morimoto on tenor sax. Ray Scro on baritone saxophone. Emil Turner on trumpet. Adrian Alvarado, guitar, Mamika Watanabe on piano, and Rabi Amin on drums. So let's start it out. Angel Heart, track one. Uh, this begins with an eight bar intro of bass, light clicky drums, and washy Rhodes piano. Over that, there's some nice acoustic guitar, rippling phrases, and chords from Alvarado. The horns come in with a four bar arranged line, and Debriano answers that with some ringing and running bass. Uh, they do it again. Uh, then the horns get a longer strain. It's a very relaxed phrasing. Uh, that leads into some guitar flourishes from Alvarado, more horns, and then a longer guitar solo. After that, there's a gruff-toned but smoothly phrased berry sax solo from Skrull, a flute solo from Brockfeld, and a tenor solo from Morimoto, all 12 bars each. Uh, Debriano gets a solo next. His bass sounds huge and ringing with clear attack. The horns come back for another line, and there are some more guitar flurries from Alvarado before the horns take it out with a final bass flourish from Debriano. It's an interesting arrangement and structure with a really relaxed feel. Hmm. Track two, Ashanti. This one's got kind of a light Latin beat intro to start it out from the rhythm section. It feels like a seven beat pattern of four plus three beats. Uh, the horns come in with a cool arrangement of the melody that has a lot of separate moving lines. I love the flute on top of the arrangement. Uh, it gets broken up with a little bass and left-hand piano interlude before it continues on. Debriano breaks out of that with a bass solo. It keeps the rhythms very punchy, even as faster lines seem to be pressurized, like the, hmm. the attack of his fingers. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, Brackfield has a pretty fluttering butterfly-like flute solo and gets some nice breathy tones in, too. Amin adds some tasty drum fills near the end of that flute solo. TK Blues up next for an alto solo uh, with unique phrasing, some high cries and low digs down in the lower range. And Watanabe follows on piano, ringing sounds and connected runs. Uh, she's on acoustic piano for this tune. Uh, the horns are all back together for a more unified syncopated arrangement with some interplay with Amin's drums. And Scrosberry really honks out in that arrangement. Uh, you know, so you've got that flute high on the top and the berry way down low. I, I really like that instrumentation on the arrangements. They incorporate the piano and bass break uh, of the horns again, and then they carry it on to the end. Track three, Imaginary Guinea. Airy and eerie sounds start this one out until Debriano comes in with a loping six-beat ostinato bass line. Uh, cymbals paced in and piano and guitar add sparse chords. The horns come in on a legato theme. Turner has the harmon mute in the trumpet, which always sounds great with the flute tone in an arrangement. Uh, the lines flow easily over the six-beat feel. Brockfield gets a flute solo first, this time exploring more of the warm lower register to start uh, with a nice sense of hesitancy, too. Scrow follows on barry sax, blowing delicately to match the quieter mood. There are a few sparse backing lines from the saxes. Alvarado comes up next for an acoustic guitar solo with some really interesting doodles. Uh, through this whole album, he sort of plays to his own rhythm. I mean, his what he plays fits in, but uh, he's a very kind of free-flowing phraser on the guitar. Watanabe follows on a gentle piano solo, and then there are rhythmic staccato sax stabs for backing as a nice little touch. Uh, Debriano gets a bass solo next, more assertive and bluesy. The horn arrangements 
uh, returns to take it through the theme again. The final phrase repeats and fades with little piano and flute and other flourishes continuing over Debriano's bass to a mysterious end. And there's kind of a harmonic whistling at the end. Uh, listen closely. Is that flute? I'm not sure, but uh, it's an interesting little effect. Track four, Imagined Nation. Uh, Amin starts this one out with an interesting drum groove, joined by Debriano's bass and a rhythmic left-hand figure by Watanabe. I'm not sure how they would write the meter, but if you count it in the double time feel, you get two bars of six and then one of four, which gives it a kind of forward skipping feel when those two beats are, are missing in that third bar. Uh, the horns stack on top, the berry working with the uh, lower piano figure, and the others with more swooping lines. There's some syncopated breaks with drum fills to push it into another round. Uh, Debriano launches out of that with a bass solo, got some machine gun-like fast figures in there, uh, and great kind of feeding on from Amin's drums. TK Blue follows another intense alto solo. He passes the solo baton onto Morimoto, who keeps up that intensity on tenor, and Debriano's walking furiously underneath on the bass. Uh, Watanabe is next on piano, some tricky right-hand rhythmic licks, and the whole band has a new unison arrangement with gaps for Amin to fill with intense drumming. After a final fast descending line, it connects back with the intro idea of the piano and Barry Sachs rhythmic riff, and the horn line with a build-up to the end. It's an intense tune with a lot of tricky rhythmic things going on. Hmm. Track five, Till Then. Uh, Watanabe gives this one a piano intro with rhythmic descending figures. The horns, I think just saxes and flute, couldn't hear much of the trumpet, uh, pick up a line into a theme with cute fluttering ornaments over a light Latin beat. Uh, Watanabe is up first for a solo with chasing lines and trills. Brockfeld gets a floating flute solo over chords from Alvarado on the guitar. And TK Blue has a solo working in the lower range of the alto. And Scro also gets a short berry solo here uh, before Debriano also with a brief solo. The horns return with the theme to the end. Track six, Spunky. Mm. Uh, the horns started out with a repetitive rhythmic lick line over guitar that builds tension as it goes along. The next section has cool syncopated choppy breakups accented by bass and drums and then fills for drums. It's tricky and fun, and we're swinging on this tune. Uh, Amin fills the break into a solo from Scro on Barry Sax, and Emil Turner is up next for his first trumpet solo on the recording. He keeps it kind of relaxed, sparse, and swinging. Uh, Brockfield is then next on a flute solo, cool rhythmic pauses, and Alvarado gets a solo on guitar. And as I said, he really is doing his own thing here with these kind of bursting figures. Uh, quite impressive technique, though. Uh, the horns come back with a driving unison line, uh, driven hard by Amin on drums. Uh, it gets soft and then builds up again, the choppy melody driving to the end. Uh, another fun rhythmic tune. Then we've got the orchestra boogaloo for track seven. <laughs> Uh, it's a four-bar busy beat drum intro to this happy-sounding boogaloo melody arranged nicely for the horns. Uh, Barry and another sax are honking out steady notes under the bluesy lines of the others on top. Uh, there's some fun extra slow percussion scratching in the mix uh, there. Brockfield bursts out with another flute solo soaring high, varied articulation and rhythms, and she's really impressed so far on this recording. Uh, Watanabe has some good rhythms going on in the piano underneath. Turner gets a trumpet solo again next, uh, adding fun trills and leaving gaps of anticipation. And then Watanabe gets rhythmic and bluesy in her piano solo. Also some playful intervals in there too. And TK Blue gets a sassy alto solo, uh, the horns adding rhythmic backing lines. And Debriano cleans up with a solo of blazing bass lines and a uh, kind of a cool bend, bent note in there too. Uh, the horns return with the boogaloo theme pumping it out to the end. This one's a lot of fun. Hmm. Track eight, Basilar. Debriano starts it with a very cool ringing ostinato bass figure. Piano, guitar, and drums add in to herald the horns on a syncopated rhythmic horn arrangement. Pushes ahead with big accents. Debriano bursts out with a bluesy solo over the minor chords. And TK blues up with a short but intense alto solo. Uh, Brockfield gets a flute solo with super flutters this time. Uh, hmm. Morimoto follows with an edgy tone tenor sax solo, and Alvarado, another free-flowing guitar solo 
some dazzling speedy lines here too. Uh, there's some groaning vocalizations there too. <laughs> Take a listen. <laughs> Someone's groaning uh, during that guitar solo. I don't know if it's him or someone else. Uh, the horns return with the insistent melody line. And Debriano has some really fast bursting bass underneath. I mean, is in full assault mode on the drums <laughs> with Watanabe ringing out the chords. Uh, and it fades out uh, to end on this one. Yeah, you know, the guitar is kind of through through most of the record. He's kind of like a little bit back, but on this particular track, he's really close. And I'm wondering if that's why you're getting his groans. Could be, the, um, <laughs> it could be. You know, on the um, that's it yeah. on the recording. Maybe I don't know. We've got track nine, Mister Monk. You can guess who that monk is? Yeah, the Thelonious one. Uh, and this is a real fun tune. A honking berry set against playful monkish higher figures in the saxes and piano for an opening. Uh, the melody has fun horn arrangements with bouncy lines. TK Blue takes a gutsy solo on alto here over the choppy rhythm laid down by the trio. He really digs in the lower register. Uh, it switches up from the choppy feel to swing and back on the way, and then speeds up to a furious swing drive uh, with the other horns joining in for backing. Uh, Morimoto is up next on tenor sax, and he's charged up for the repeat of the circus of rhythmic changes. It wouldn't be complete without Scro having a go on the berry, and he's ready too, honking it out again. And Watanabe gets the final run on piano, building as it pushes on with the horns pressing it. The horns take another run through the theme, and there's an outro like the intro with that berry and other sax honking line and some final monk chimes on the piano to wrap it up. Yeah, that, that honking pattern kind of re reminded me of a car. It was like a... Yeah. There's something yeah. about the pattern that kind of like yeah. reminded me of an angry driver or something. <laughs> I really liked this. Uh, you know, they, they captured that kind of quirky goofiness of, of Monk's yeah. phrasing and playing style, but it's sort of worked into the horn arrangement. Right. Yeah. And I love patterns like that too because they're instantly recognizable if you kind of yeah. put them like you bring them back or something like that. I really yeah. like that a Pretty lot. Pretty cool. And we're going to close the album out with track 10, Portrait. This is just a solo bass piece to finish it out. Debriano gets to show off his great ringing and deep tone all on his own. Uh, there are rumbles on the way and a few dissonant harmonics creating, or harmonies rather, creating tension uh, before it ends of course, sort of more resolved. So this album has a very unique atmosphere. It's rhythmic, but often relaxed. And then it builds to some more intense numbers later in the program. Debriano's bass sound and style is unique. Uh, the horn arrangements are excellent and make use of all the voices very well, especially great solos by Brackfeld on the flute throughout. Uh, TK Blue and all the other sexes are excellent too. You get Latin grooves and some swinging fun arrangements. I liked it a lot and I think you will too. Yeah, you said a, a unique atmosphere and I kind of tried to define what that unique atmosphere was. It was really the, um, for me, the uh, tone colors of the instruments. You had a flute. Uh, first of all, Debriano's bass playing is very percussive. Like when he plucks the strings, he really plucks them hard and almost has like this mm -hmm. almost percussive attack to it. Yeah. You, know, you kind of actually feel it you know, as well as hear it. And um, you had the flute, of course, and then there's that acoustic guitar, which had a really unique sound to it. It, it was very light mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, almost like a, a pastel sort of um, instrumental yeah. color. And I really loved that too. So the, this was what really drew, pulled me in. And it was really, especially the, um, the guitar's diffuse, uh, soft tone and attack. So the unique timbres on the album and including the bass, just the way the bass like really just kind of percussively yeah. plucked those strings and had like a, a dimensionality to the sound. So I want this on CD. I'm gonna, I hope this comes yeah. out. I thought it was really interesting and unique, this record. Yeah, all original compositions, yeah. very well arranged. And good playing, yeah. Something yeah. fresh and cool. Yeah. And we're going to get uh, all original compositions on the next recording, too. And this will be our final bass-led recording from Rodney Whitaker. This is on the Origin label, Oasis, the music of Greg Hill. So Whitaker is a uh, university professor emeritus of jazz bass and director of jazz studies at Michigan State University. He's played with uh, a lot of big names, Donald Harrison, Terrence Blanchard, Roy Hargrove, Wynton Marsalis. Here, he's doing this third album of compositions by the composer Greg Hill. And the first album was Common Ground in 2019, and the second, Outrospection, in 2021. And they're both on Origin Records as well. 
Greg Hill, the uh, Michigan-based composer, has uh, published 145 original jazz compositions uh, in wow. four <laughs> volumes. Uh, so we've got uh, Outrospective, Spontaneity, Moon Ducks, and The Tuning Fork. And uh, 10 albums have been released with the compositions so far. Uh, so he's kind of a prolific writer with some really uh, unique and tricky things going on in his compositions. So uh, I could see how you know, it would be fun to get into these arrangements and perform. Uh, rounding out on this album, we've got Terrell Stafford on trumpet and flugelhorn, Tim Warfield, tenor and soprano sax, Bruce Barth, a uh, favorite of ours on piano. Yeah, I like um, him too. Yeah. Whitaker's on bass, Dana Hall on drums, and we've got some vocals too from Raquel Fortin. Starts out with Betty's tune, uh, and this begins with a 16-bar intro from the trio, uh, in a fast minor swing. Barth really hammers out the chords and Whitaker's bass is walking intensely. And then we get uh, Raquel Fortin coming in on the 32 bar lyric verse. Uh, the melody has a lot of repeated patterns and the words are kind of impressionistic about the mind being free uh, with uh, magic in a melody. Hmm. Stafford and Warfield come in on a unison horn line on trumpet and soprano sax. It consists mostly of a one-note syncopated rhythmic pattern until the end phrase. A uh, Whitaker changes up from the fast walking to snappy syncopated figures underneath, and that leads to a trumpet solo from Stafford. He's very energized, working in some cool interval ideas and then getting into the higher register uh, with some cheering on with one note line from uh, Warfield, who gets a soprano solo next. Uh, Stafford returns the favor with backing lines for him, and then we get uh, Barth up next, uh, for a busy and percussive solo. Listen to his pressing left hand. Uh, very mm. intense. The horns cheer him on as well. Dana Hall comes up next for an authoritative drum solo, and the horns return with another little drum continuation, and then the horns take it into another round of the verse from Fortin. Uh, the horns press it on to the end with some more drum flourishes from Hall, and the tune has a lot of drive and energy to it. Track two is Puppets, uh, this one starts with an eight-bar intro from the trio, ringing notes from Barth, and Whitaker is ringing out uh, three-beat bass notes and simple textures from Hall. The horns get a lazy 16-bar melody line. Uh, Stafford's got a harmon mute in his trumpet, and Warfield's still on soprano. Hall mixes up around the kit with different techniques, not marking out the time. Uh, Stafford is up first for a muted... Uh, solo on the ring over the ringing bass of Whitaker. He favors long notes, savoring the muted tone of the trumpet. Uh, Barth joins back in with chords during the solo, as does uh, Warfield with backing lines from the melody. And Warfield gets a soprano solo next. Uh, the meter changes up to a medium four beat swing. Uh, with walking bass from Whitaker on the way. Uh, he starts out with shorter phrase ideas and builds off moving them uh, around the harmonies, uh, building tension with rhythmic hesitation. Uh, Whitaker adds a little backing trumpet, and then Barth is up next for a piano solo, having some interesting rhythmic play as well. The horns have backing lines too, and the rhythm gets complicated. There's sort of a polyrhythm going on. Hall's cymbals are marking 6-8, but if you listen to Whitaker's bass, He's got uh, four beats, uh, so he's got two beats for every three that you can feel in the, <laughs> the drums. Um, mm -hmm. Then Whitaker gets a solo next. His sound is big and bold as he keeps it mostly in the middle and lower registers with accented lines. Uh, the horns add some backing here too. Uh, Hall follows with a drum solo, and the horns come in again for a final line, and then it switches up again to a 6-8 feel like the intro with Barthes' piano, uh, the horns adding improvised ideas to a quiet ending. Track three, Minorabilia. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting <laughs> title. Title, yeah. It's a two-beat mm -hmm. snare hit into a medium slow swinging melody from the horns. Warfield on tenor here. It's it basically like a 12-bar blues phrase length, but with interesting, mainly minor chord progressions. Uh, they go around it twice, then Barth gets a piano solo. Uh, there's a nice rhythmic snap in his phrases. The next time around, they give it a double time feel, but the form is doubled too. So it's fa fast, but it's still uh, going to get a 24 bar length out of the 12 bars. Uh, Stafford is next on a trumpet solo, and he really cranks it up when they go double time on him uh, with great fast boppy lines and some piercing high lines. Then Warfield's on tenor, and he's in a wailing mo mode with a lot of hard blowing in the middle and lower register. 
Whitaker follows on bass, and he's got a lot of fun with rhythmic gaps in his lines. He keeps on with big bass walking notes uh, for Hall to have some drum fun around the kit uh, with a lot of tight snare work. And then the horns come back for another two times around the melody to an ending on a big minor chord. Track four is called Interlude, and this is a slow ballad with an intro of lifting horn lines. Fortin's back on vocals for this one. The melody has tricky intervals and rhythms, but she does a nice job phrasing it. It's a 16-bar melody that has the same lyrics uh, twice, I think. Uh, Stars at night to make her own, the moon and dawn's early light, dreams that are a secret. Warfield has a soprano sax solo. Barth follows on piano. Hall is kicking things up on the drums into a double-time feel, and he keeps pushing it into a trumpet solo from Stafford, who really lifts over the rising chord changes. Uh, they pull it back to the ballad feel for Fortin to return with the verse again. Uh, the horns give it an outro with hesitation into the last note. Track 5, Sunday Afternoon, and it's got a medium tempo, easy swinging tune that actually feels like a Sunday afternoon. Uh, hmm. The horns come in right away on a unison 24-bar melody. Warfield's back on tenor here. Stafford uh, comes out first for a trumpet solo. He blows relaxed lines, and I really like his bright tone. He gets into some more double time, still keeping that kind of burnished... It's a tone you don't hear very often. It reminded me a lot of like Clifford Brown's sound on the old... Hmm. Uh, records. Uh, Warfield's next on tenor. He has some fun with the rhythmic phrasing uh, that Hall picks up on and responds to on drums. Barth shows off his nice touch on this one with a variety of articulation and dynamics, and Whitaker gets a bass solo, uh, making it melodic but still with snappy accents. Stafford, Warfield, and Barth then trade off fours with Hall's drums for a round, and they take it through the tune once more to finish it up. Now, <laughs> this next one is a, uh, a little bit of a interesting thing jazz diddy waltz hmm. a four bar intro of chiming piano and then some light cymbals over bass and we're off swinging on a happy horn melody uh it's a 32 bar a a b a form uh that with a real lift in the v section and it's a jazz diddy waltz in four four time <laughs> yeah. so, go figure yeah, yeah. go figure not what i was expecting from the title uh stafford gets a trumpet solo first it's bright boppy with nice ornaments Warfield follows on soprano. Uh, there's great high-range walking by Whitaker underneath on the bass. Barth is uh, next on piano, and then Whitaker keeps it walking for Hall to do uh, drumming, focusing on the snare. They take it through the melody once more to close it out. Track 7, School Days. That's S apostrophe cool days. School Days. Very yeah. clever. <laughs> clever title. Yeah. This one's got a unique intro with rhythmic piano figures and furious drumming from Hall. Uh, then we're off on a fun swinging minor horn melody. There's a 16-bar strain that repeats. Then from what I can hear, there's 10 measures of 6-8. Then a uh, repeat of the first 16-bar melody. That's very unique. <laughs> um, yeah. Warfield busts out of that with a tenor solo with gutsy phrasing. Uh, they leave the... 6-8 transition section out in the solo, so I can see why. Uh, Barth is up next with uh, nice percussive ideas and then speedy flowing lines. And Stafford follows with an easy flowing trumpet solo that he works up into some Armstrong-esque high note reaching lines. Like, <laughs> they <laughs> got to go higher next and higher next, and uh, uh, really fun. Uh, hmm. Whitaker and Hall trade fours for a go-around after that, and they finish it off with another go-around on the original melody pattern, including the 6-8 section uh, to wrap it up. Tricky. Track 8, Blues for Greg. I assume that's uh, the composer. Uh, Hall gives a four-bar drum intro to this 12-bar minor blues melody. It's accented and swinging. They go around it twice, and Whitaker's set for a bass solo. He makes it big-toned and bluesy for four choruses. Barth is next. He's got some rhythmic fun with bluesy ideas and a chimey ending. And Warfield comes next with a tenor solo with some more wailing phrases to it. Stafford starts his solo more playfully, gets into some more double time lines, climbing higher and really burning it up with some high register rhythmic licks and clipped notes. His playing's really impressing me on this recording. Hall gets to round it out on drums. They take it around the blues theme twice again to wrap it up with a few fun phrase repeats at the end to stretch it out. Track nine, fan o -gram. It starts with an eight-bar trio intro into a cool loping bass ostinato and tasty trickles from Barth on the piano. The horns take the minor 
lightly swinging melody that has some playful rhythmic phrases. It's a 32 bar AABA form. Hall mixes up the rhythm nicely on the B section with some Latin y symbols and clicks as a contrast. Barth gets to solo first here, swinging hard, adding big forceful accents. Warfield's on soprano after that uh, with some uh, lines with in interesting rhythmic hesitations and a bluesy ending. And then Stafford again builds a nice storyline on his trumpet, finding bluesy phrases and some clear high note phrases. Whitaker gets a bass solo. After that, relaxed but with nice snap in the lines, then the horns and Barth trade fours on a go-around with Hall on the drums. They finish it off with another run through the melody, repeating the final phrase a few times. Track 10, To the Well, mysterious metallic rubbing and whale call-like sounds uh, lead to a drum tom <laughs> exposition from Hall. Uh, final roll and cymbal crash bring the band in at about a minute and 10 seconds. Uh, there's dark and rolling rubato chords that have like modal lines laid on from Stafford on trumpet and Warfield on soprano sax. Barth hammers out the scary harmonies with force. At about 2 minutes and 45 uh, seconds, Hall gets a beat going on the toms and Whitaker joins in with a bass ostinato. It's slow and trance-like. Uh, Fortin is then back for uh, the lyrics that are about sensing the great unknown, the mood mysterious but uplifting. Uh, the lyric verse is only 16 bars, and Stafford adds some soft backing lines on trumpet. Uh, Barth gets a piano solo then, some tasty modal lines and a soft touch that leads to more chiming notes, and Stafford follows on trumpet with a restrained but bright solo, uh, nice articulation touches. Uh, Warfield then is coming in on soprano, starting in the lower register, uh, keeping his solo subdued, uh, but charming some serpents with the uh, modes <laughs> and that kind of uh, tone that only the soprano can get. Uh, Fortin sings another round of the verse, and it comes to a softer ending, but with some final toms from Hall. And we're going to end up with the title track, Oasis. Uh, Hall lays down a rock beat for an eight-bar intro with syncopated bass and some bluesy improvisations from Barth. Fortin comes in again on the lyrics for this tune. Uh, the main verse is 12 bars, and then there's a seven-bar bluesy refrain for an unusual phrase length of 19 bars. The refrain lyrics are, Love, my fortress, my refuge, my forever, that the bass and horns join in in unison. Uh, kind of like a real... A bluesy refrain. The solos all follow this 19-bar format. Stafford comes out of that with a lively trumpet solo spitting out tight rhythmic and bluesy phrases. Uh, nice articulation here. Uh, Warfield's next on soprano. He keeps it funky and bluesy with Stafford and the bass backing uh, with the unison refrain. Barth gets a rhythmic and bluesy solo after that, and then Whitaker gets the final solo with some powerful bluesy bass lines. Then Fortin comes back to finish it off with another round of the verse. And that's it. It's a long recording at an hour mm -hmm. and 12 minutes and a, a really good introduction to the music of Greg Hill, if you haven't heard it before. You can check out the previous two releases as well. He writes very interesting structures and harmonies uh, that don't really go where you expect them to a lot of the time. Uh, the lyrics are brief and impressionistic with unique melodies to them. Uh, Whitaker's the leader here, and he has a big bass presence throughout, a real kind of sense of authority in his attack and interesting <laughs> solos. And Hall is a hard hitter on the drums. <laughs> this guy really I slams. mentioned that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really good tight grooves. Yeah. Raquel Fortin's vocals are enthusiastic and uplifting. They sort of seem to be just the right voice for these kind of uh, right. sparse impressionist sort of uh, painting of words that uh, are added in here. And Barth is creative and energetic as always, but I was especially impressed with the great trumpet solos uh, from Stafford on this recording. Yeah, um, for me, I thought this, um, I got the impression that the musicians were really liked this music a lot because there's a lot of energy in them you know even in the mm -hmm. ballad you can kind of almost feel this real like almost enthusiasm you know yeah. you just feel like the that the players are all kind of happy to be together and uh yeah basically in my notes i mentioned a lot of the same things you did the hard-hitting drums and the uh, the middle eastern quality of the uh, soprano saxophone all that mo <laughs> yeah. modal yeah. playing he got some really interesting sounds out of that so um yeah i'm interested i want to i may have to go back and listen to some of the other um, Greg Hill compositions yeah. that Rodney Whitaker and I guess other people too recorded. This was really, uh, it was really good. And it was mostly because the, of the, um, 
the ensemble, the band, were sounded really enthusiastic about the compositions, and that right. kind of pulled me in too. Yeah, I like this mm. kind of an interesting idea. You know, we get you know a lot of new jazz compositions, and there's some groups like the the Jazz Composers Octet, which is a group right. of you know musician composers who play each other's tunes, and but we don't often hear an album sort of all dedicated to one composer's works and so you know, although we've been hearing more of them lately in the last uh, year or two i think you in know jazz? we had um yeah and jess we had the uh oh who was it last year with the, the one with um i don't even remember who it was chicken that all those great musicians were on chicoria christian mcbride were on it the, oh. do you remember that one it was a double album and it had mm. all these these four different ensembles man i gotta look yeah i gotta look it up we, we picked it as one of the best of the year too i can't remember Oh, my but, memory's uh, <laughs> going well. Yeah, the, there we go. We don't remember. But, you know, there was, well, the Mingus one is pretty obvious from yeah. this year. It was like all Mingus yeah. um, compositions. But uh, this one was, I'm going to check, Jerry Gibbs. That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was all like songs from, you know, his his father's songs. Right, right. Yeah. But as far as, uh, you know, sort of a, mm. just a contemporary person known for his composing, Right. I think it's a nice kind of trend, though, is what like I'm trying it. to say. I, like it I think a lot. it's yeah. happening. Yeah. And uh, I really like the arrangements that uh, have been worked out here by Whitaker. So I, I've i just sort of passively listened to one of the previous ones, but I want to go back and sort of dig in a little bit more uh, because you know, these are kind of tricky to listen to and figure out what's going on. Yeah. A little bit uh, unique in you know the chord progressions and the structures of the tunes uh, so i think there's a lot to uh enjoy and uh, yeah. feed your ears with this so. and like i said the enthusiasm of the musicians pulled me in yeah. so yeah. i think it will pull you into a listener so yes. give it a try so you got a lot of unique and interesting music uh this week in both uh yeah classical and jazz uh stuff you've never heard before i'm i'm sure and I want to say, I've got a lot of cello stuff myself, so I could do another, we could do another cello and bass episode pretty soon if we yeah, want to. So we we'll look into it after Christmas, maybe. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting grouping. And, uh, well, as we mentioned uh, earlier next week, we're going to get in the holiday spirit a little bit early. Right. Well, it'll be December. Can't put it off forever. But well, you're going to be listening to, you know, all these records in November, though. So there you go. Uh, Unless you're going to cram them all into the first two yeah, days yeah. of December. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I guess I'll December start. December starts, what, on Thursday? Yeah, it starts uh, on Thursday already. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas shopping. Oh, man. Christmas shopping. Then the New Year's going to come. Ugh. Well, the anyway, we'll mid, have a... The bleak midwinter. <laughs> we'll have our little <laughs> feast to look forward to. And uh, Yeah, this is actually my favorite time of the year for uh, listening to music, too, is I just want to mm -hmm. stay home and, you know, just kind of put the stereo on. Just, I yeah. really want to hear everything. I kind of like tend to like everything i hear yeah so if, so if anybody wants to get like a good review or a good uh discussion of your music on adult music just uh release it in november or december and yeah. you'll you'll probably yeah. uh, catch me in a good mood all right so we'll look forward to that uh remember the playlist for that will go up on deezer and i'll have a link to it on facebook uh, after this episode is published tomorrow so if you want to get started on your holiday music listening uh, that'll be there for you uh, as always, we want to thank Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo. Always catches the eye. I think it's quite unique. Uh, yeah. As I mentioned, check out those other podcasts. Uh, Something came from Baltimore. Famous interviews in neon jazz and the same difference. The links will be there in the bottom of the description. I want to say, by the way, about the uh, the adult music logo. He he printed up uh, business cards for us too. And whenever mm -hmm. I give, and it's got the adult music logo on the back with our names kind of on yeah, the yeah. other side. And uh, whenever I give it to people, they see the logo and they're always like looking at me like they kind of take a step back sort of like, yeah. you know, in a way. And they say, what is this podcast about? <laughs> yeah. It kind of looks like, you know, come to my nightclub. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know. I think I find it funny though. I yeah, I like it. I had the same mm -hmm. uh, reaction from someone I gave one to uh, a couple weeks ago, so. <laughs> yeah, I think well, we're trying to change the image. I don't know yeah. how, but <laughs> we're definitely trying to get it out of its stodgy kind of like, uh, you know, sort of yeah. um, sort of image, let's say. We're, the, we're serious about the music, but not about yeah. uh, ourselves. So. Or anything else. <laughs> or anything else. 
<laughs> maybe a few things, but uh, yeah, maybe one or two things. I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, episode 91, getting close to that 100 mark, and uh, we haven't missed one week yet this year, and uh, God willing and the planets aligning, we'll uh, go right on through to the end and uh, finish out the year with a perfect record. So, Yeah, we're looking good. We're gonna, we've, yeah. We will have fulfilled our uh, New Year's resolution. It's looking that's pretty right. good, because we said we'd do 52 episodes this year, or, or every week we'd say right. we'd do it. Yeah, and we had yeah. a couple of interviews this year too. So yeah, not bad. Yeah. Looking good. All ready for twenty twenty three coming well, soon. Well, not yet. Yeah. There's still some weeks of uh, new music coming in December. So yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. So keep listening. Check out that holiday playlist, and we'll be back with holiday music next week for episode. 92 of adult music. Gerald Albright, Priya Snyder, Charlie Hunter, Duke Robillard, Sean Jones, Walter Beasley, Steve Swallow. Something Came From Baltimore is a jazz, blues, and R&B podcast and radio show, and it's not really about Baltimore. Subscribe to the podcast and listen to your favorite artist or future favorite artist that Something Came From Baltimore and be a part of that Be More music scene. Joe Lovano, Jeff Coffin, Paula Cole, Denuso Makatani, Ann Passio, Chess Smith, Thumbscrew, mostly. Thank you.